Well, hello everybody and welcome along to our live coverage of the Sebring 12 hours. The Mobile One at 12 hours of Sebring presented by Advance Auto Parts. It's John Hindoff and Jeremy Shaw in the Haggerty Broadcast Centre along with Shea Adam who is our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock Reporter. Three and three quarter miles around and a wonderful circuit with 17 corners here in central florida that has a rich motorsport heritage going back to well originally the home of the u.s grand prix but there's been plenty of sports car action here down the years as well and much of it it's a great history written in the imsa era huge crowd on hand here today and traffic problems for people coming in so uh, if you are listening to us now on imsa radio via the internet and you're getting close to the track wwoj on 99.1 will be taking our call of the race all the way through till after 10 o'clock local time tonight if you are so equipped Sirius 216 XM392 if you're further afield then you can be watching live uninterrupted video on imsaradio.com at IMSA Radio with the hashtag RSL Sebring if you want to speak to us. We're 10 minutes away from Green Flag. Let's pick up some of the stories around this race week. First of all, this was supposed to be the opening round of the FIA World Endurance Championship. It was meant to have happened yesterday owing to the issues with international travel. That hasn't happened. They've moved uh, in to, moved twice now, actually, uh, and they're hoping to get the first round of the WEC off in Spa in about a month's time at the Spa-Francorchamps circuit. So that left a bit of a hole in the a track schedule Mazda MX-5 stepped in and has given us some wonderful entertainment from the Edemitsu Mazda MX-5 Cup we've seen already two races from them we've seen two races from the brand new Porsche Carrera Cup North America and of course we had the Allen G Automotive Networks 120 for the Mission and Pilot Challenge yesterday all of those all of those were the aperitif we've got the main course being if you will, being plated up uh, at the moment, Jeremy Shaw, and it's a main course that is absolutely mouth-watering as we contemplate a full 12 hours at the right place, at the right time of year, and seemingly only five minutes since we were here at the back end, or in the middle of uh, November last year. Yeah, are we ready yet? Uh, this is going to be fun, uh, and it's a, a bit of a curveball to the teams this morning. Uh, I mean, they knew about it in advance, but it's significantly cooler than it has been for much of the weekend. And I think the temperatures are only supposed to rise uh, to a high of about 73 degrees today. Yesterday, I think, was in the 80s, uh, and certainly was in the, even in the 90s on uh, on Thursday. So uh, that's going to be. You know, this this track is very temperature sensitive, if you like, in terms of uh, how the the cars react to the racetrack and uh, that's a big factor here and that's certainly something that all of the teams with with a lot of experience will be able to cope with a lot better than those who don't having said that of course most of these teams are pretty experienced here at Sebring. Shea we're going to have uh, a car starting well out of where we expected to see it uh, and in fact I'm hearing now that the 47 motorsport car will, will start from pit lane. Yes, correct. Did not make it out of the pit lane for the reconnaissance lap. You have a window, I believe it's three minutes, to get out of the pit lane and get around the track to then find your position. For the false grid, the 47 machine did not make it out of the pit lane, meaning that the number seven Duquesne will be starting from the pit lane after the entire field has gone by the start finish line, not just the prototypes, and then it will have to serve a drive through penalty on top of it. The good news, though, Oliver Askew starting that car, and he is one speedy kid. He'll get it back up to the front in no time. Looked like there was. Uh... Yeah, that, uh, that was a, a good pick-up by the 47 Motorsport guys. Uh, Stephen McLean uh, making a bit of a name for himself as a super sub. If you are a follower of Cadillac, and particularly uh, of Jimmy Johnson, who uh, came to have a go at Daytona at the Rolex 24 game this year, you might well know that that car was in a bit of trouble at the end of qualifying yesterday, Jeremy. But the Action Express 
team who run the number 48 Ally Cadillac have done a cracking job overnight uh, and that car was third quickest in the warm-up this morning and Jimmy now back behind the wheel of that car for the first time since he crashed it at turn 16 and 17 yesterday afternoon. Yeah, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. He had a spin at 16, didn't hit anything, uh, got down to 17 and did. Um, no, sorry, not un unnecessarily facetious there, I think. Uh, but as, like I said a little while ago, Jimmy did show very, very good pace in qualifying. And uh, that car has been built up around a new tub. Luckily, they had a spare tub there and they were able to get that car up again. Lucas, massively experienced team, of course, at Action Express Racing. So it really shouldn't be a problem. And uh, Jimmy Johnson, well, it's, that wasn't the first accident he's ever had in a racing car, so uh, I don't think he'll have really too much difficulty in getting himself up to speed again. I was going to ask you that. Does it, does it dent the confidence of somebody with that much racing experience? And he's not sat in the car. He didn't get in the car this morning in the 20-minute warm-up session. His two teammates did. Does, does that slightly surprise you that he didn't at least go out and have a couple of laps and effectively get back on the horse that threw him? Uh, yes, in a way, but uh, but Jimmy, you know, he, his his job in this race, he doesn't have anything like as much prototype experience as the as the other two. Uh, Kobe Ashley, of course, he's a two-time winner at Daytona in a Cadillac. Pagano, most of his driving uh, has not been a, in a Cadillac, so he's getting used to that car this season. They are going to be doing the bulk of the driving, so I think it makes sense for them to uh, to have the time in the car this morning. You know, he, his job is just to to keep it clean, bring it home, and hand it over to those two. To, to bring it home to the finish of the race. So I'm sure that was a strategy there as to why Jimmy didn't drive this morning. And, you know, I mean, as I said before, he's, he's had lots of crashes before and bounced back right away. No. Yeah, and he's going to have to do that again, no pun intended, bounce back again. A high today of around about 26 Celsius, that's 78 degrees, with a few extra clouds bubbling up in the evening track temperatures uh, sitting around about 24 celsius at the in the morning uh, uh, in the morning sunshine uh, that will rise of course it's 18 celsius at the moment sheer adam uh, we have got uh, the pit exit closed I'm just checking on the race control. All of those penalties that I'm seeing on the race control feed, I presume, are from morning warm-up this morning, Shea, correct? Correct. That is uh, the case. Yeah. Nobody got a penalty leaving the pit lane was, to go to the grid. I was just checking. <laughs> I was just checking that. Uh, Shea Adam, our VP, Racing Fuel Pit, and Paddock re reporter uh, there, keeping him across. Uh, Nick Damon will join us as well as our second VP Racing Field Pit Paddock reporter, Jeremy Shaw and me, John Hindhoff in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre for uh, the race today. What can we expect? Well, the old days of taking it easy uh, and nursing cars to the end largely have disappeared. The reliability, and I realise I might be uh, already getting the curse of the commentator very very much out of the box uh, and setting it free but nowadays reliability of these endurance racing cars is quite extraordinary uh, we uh, see nothing like the kind of mechanical attrition and problems that we would have done maybe even just 10 or 15 years ago so is it a 12-hour sprint well something close to it but in our Porsche keys to the race we know that the teams have to be there in whatever class. You have to be there in good shape in the dark. No mistakes in the pits. There'll be plenty of time uh, in that you'll come down the pit lane and some of those will be under green flag conditions. Watch the watch. That's drive time, not just for the pro am uh, categories, but also for the pros. Make sure that you uh, aren't exceeding the time in the car in any given period. There's very specific rules uh, about that there's a race within a race here for the michelin endurance cup with points there awarded at four eight and 12 hours so you may well see teams and drivers who are involved in that part of the imsa championship going a little off strategy and maybe pitting with a short stint before they get to those time markers within the race so at a third uh, two thirds uh, and uh, at the end uh, of the the race well you might just see that happen 
where the uh, the drivers get off kilter trying to maximize their points tally for the michelin endurance cup and the tires well you have a tire allocation for the week they start adducing them on thursday we don't know how many sets of stickers uh, the individual teams have but they'll want to have at least one set for the charge to the chequered flag at just after 10 o'clock local something else to keep an eye on as we come round to the green flag is the split start with the prototypes at the head of the field the gt categories have their own pace car as it is now sitting in behind with a little bit of a gap so it will be people to running for wheel and engineering in the red white cadillac the conning of an order of ricky taylor on his inside he's already been dropped and coming through into second place it looks like Renga van der zander in the zero one cadillac has got a pretty good run and he's on the inside to turn one the lighter colored car holds the inside line the black and blue car has to give way and that was the front row start of ricky taylor 31 zero one and one zero Oli Jarvis looks like he's held on to fourth position as the all Corvette front row in the silver colours this weekend for the silver anniversary of Corvette Racing's partnership with Mobile One. And straight away, the BMW goes through to the sharp end of the field and off. That's another early issue. Looks like a big spin for the G, the LMP3 number 30, uh, number 83, excuse me. Now, was that a jump or a push for Rodrigo Sales? Oh, looks like he might have uh, just gone a little bit wide. May have had a little tap at turn five. But other than that, I think we've got everybody running. Sales just wiggling the car around at the hairpin. Conor de Felipe with a cracking start, by the way, in that BMW. So action already with cars from row three in both of the pro classes jeremy shaw making the best of the start and advancing the zero one and the bmw in respectively dpi and gt Le Mans. yeah i think that start among the prototypes is not exactly as the uh, race director in intended people durani taking a bit of a, a liberty there by leaping out to a big lead as they took the uh, the green flag but uh, i don't think there'll be any penalties most likely uh, he'll get away with it uh, he's been around this sport long enough he knows uh, what penalty what would he's like to be called for penalty and what isn't the more experience that's probably the most in actual fact uh, so it is uh, Pipo Durrani there that leads from the pole position on the first up a really good start there by Renga van der Zander. he was ready for that restart uh, and Ricky Taylor who had started in second place on the outside of the front row probably wasn't uh, so uh, that's the order right now, but good to see that the prototypes and most of the prototypes through cleanly on this first lap. Shea Adam, there seemed to be some confusion behind the at least the DPIs uh, and the LMP2s and 3s were kind of all over the place there. At one stage, they looked like they'd started single file on the back straight. Yeah, there was an issue, uh, meaning that Ben Keating did not actually take the green flag on the track. He was not rolling out when everybody else was following behind the safety cars, meaning that Ben Keating was alongside Oliver Askew when they were allowed to take the green flag. It caused a lot of confusion because Keating was supposed to be starting in the second place in the LMP2 class, and everyone else behind him didn't expect him to not be there. So then there was a lot of, oh, do I go here? Do I move up? Do I stay in my place? A lot of jockeying around and a lot of confusion that ultimately led to the LMP3 cars being confused as well. The good news, though, Keating has served his drive through penalty for starting from the pit lane and he was followed in by Askew. So both of those penalties have been served. The other bad news though, the start is under review. Race Control is taking another look at it. That is uh, expected, they always will do. So just to be absolutely clear there, those drive-through penalty share were four for each of those four. For the number seven and the number 52. Uh, and that was for missing not starting where you should have been right in effect right yeah okay that's the, the good good way to describe it at imza radio if you'd like to get in touch with us we're on sirius 216 xm 392 around the circuit at wwoj 99.1 fm and around the world on rs2 imza radio.com really good start from conor de Filippi in the bmw tardy start from the outside of the front row by the second of the corvettes tommy milner and in fact he's got two bmws gone past him now but it was the red conor de felipe car that immediately 
dived into second place and then went back onto the racing line. Tommy Milner with a big Ooh. wiggle coming out, which is, I think, where the second of the BMWs, the 24 car, got through in the hands of Jesse Cron. Yes, it was. So what started, Corvette, Corvette, BMW, BMW, is now Corvette, BMW, BMW, Corvette in the running order with the Porsche, the WeatherTech Porsche, uh, in fifth position. Not a factory car, but Jeremy... That private Porsche RSR 19, the latest version uh, of Porsche's GT Le Mans car, does have factory drivers partnering with Cooper McNeil. Yeah, and uh, two very quick factory drivers as well, in fact, Germany and Matt, Matty Campbell from Australia. So, uh, you know, Cooper, he, he knows what his job in the, is in this race. So they've had, he had a, a really good run at, uh, at Daytona to begin the season. And uh, he's just going to you know, keep his nose clean, stay out of trouble. Yeah, so I'm not sure how much, how much fun it's going to be for him, quite frankly, because he's already on his own and likely to remain so for, for much of this race. But, uh, you know, I think Cooper, whenever he's driving a race car, he's having fun, and particularly when he knows he's got a chance of winning, as he will do today with those two uh, factory drivers, because they have been fantastically quick all weekend long. That has certainly been the car to beat in, uh, in qualifying. And, of course, you know, yesterday, uh, in qualifying, it is the driver who qualifies the car has to start it. So uh, Cooper it was who qualified the car. So we really didn't see the ultimate pace of that car. I think in qualifying, no disrespect to Cooper, of course. Uh, but uh, you know, when, when we get uh, down after the uh, after the pit stops are made and the other drivers take over, that car is going to be running right at the sharp end of this field in GTLM. Daniel Morad with not a great start down in GT Daytona for the GT uh, three cars. Both of the Lexus uh, went through. Aaron Tielitz and Frank Monte Calvo. Jan, Jan Halen for Wright Motorsports Porsche, the 16. Very pretty blue and black car that leads that. Then the two Bumblebee coloured Lexus. Then in fourth position is the first of the AMGs, the Electro Motorsport Mercedes AMG GT3. I, I suspect we uh, will be talking rather a lot about GT Daytona, Jeremy, because those uh, street-based cars do do really like a bit of a street fight. It's all elbows and arms and everything in there. And if, if we are talking about a sprint for 12 hours, this is probably the class where we will see that most obviously in GT Daytona. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, we always see tremendous battles there, but uh, I think a GTLM uh, also because the, uh, the, the, the the cars are running pretty much nose to tail at the moment, and uh, the two Corvettes and two BMWs seem to be very, very closely matched. In uh, qualifying yesterday, there really wasn't much to choose between them at all, just a tenth of a second, or just over a tenth of a second, covering the uh, two Corvettes and the best of the BMWs, and the second of BMWs was only another two tenths of a second further back. Uh, and uh, and so I think, yeah, we can uh, expect to see that all the way through the race, but already the GTLMs are making their way through the, the LMP3 traffic. However, mission accomplished now. With that split start, uh, it at least took uh, you know, three or four laps for the, the uh, LMP3 guys to kind of sort themselves out. So now, rather than having a clump of cars, as would have been the case if it all started together, the GTLMs can work their way past the LMP3 cars, which they are quicker than uh, on the whole, then uh, you know, it's much easier to pass them one at a time rather yes. than all in a clump. Yeah, it's, it's like that thing when you're on your favourite country road in the summer and you can go out for a drive, remember that? And you get a whole load of cars towing caravans and if there's three or four of them together, you know you're never going to get past them all because there isn't a long enough bit of straight and your car doesn't have the Bruckheimer style 18th, 19th, 20th gears uh, and some kind of turbo boost. But when there's only one, you can plan and scheme a bit and, and nip by. That's what Jeremy's talking about. Pick them off one by one, effectively. Uh, at the front of the field, it is Paul Sitter, P. Portorani uh, in first position oh here's the pole sitter into the pit lane from gt daytona this is the number 16 right motorsports porsche now is this a penalty shit adam or do they have an early problem 
This is a massive penalty. It's very rare that a pole sitter gets a penalty for a bad start. But Jan Halen changed lanes on the start. That is a no-no, necessitating the drive through that he is serving now. He's not the only car who is deemed at fault at that, though. The other one was the Ford Corvette of Tommy Milner that we saw getting passed by the two BMWs before turn three on that opening lap. He, too, changed lanes on the start. So that is another drive through penalty. Oh, dear me. Well, do you know what? If that's the only penalty they have, our Porsche keys to the race. No mistakes in the pits. We might as well have said no mistakes at all. But if you're going to have a penalty, have it with 11 hours and 50 minutes still to go. By no means are they out of it. They've lost track position. And that number 16 car has dropped way out of the battle. The 16 car has dropped way back out of the battle at Porsche in the, at the sharp end of GT Daytona. Just to... I want to say a quick hello to Andy Holbury in the UK, who I know is listening. Andy, very sorry uh, to hear about your, your dad's death uh, this week. Our condolences to you and all the, the family and his friends. Hopefully, the next 12 hours brings a bit of normality uh, to you. Uh, I know how much you enjoy your endurance race. It's a long time since we've had a chat in person. Sirius 216 XM 392 WWOG 99.1 around the track and around the world on RS2 part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels and the blue Porsche yeah pulling right across in front of actually the GT Le Mans Porsche I think I think that was the WeatherTech Porsche that uh, was somewhat held up the machine of uh, Cooper McNeil of course and the rest of his team and it is Cooper who started that if you're going to start moving around on the start Jeremy Shaw um, if you uh, have a bright blue car you really kind of don't want to be doing that uh, P. Portorani in traffic and it looks to me as though Renga van der Zander uh, has uh, got ahead there yes he has timing yet to catch up on that but the 0-1 Cadillac is in the lead through Big Ben and that I'm assuming Jeremy happened in the traffic as they hit those uh, LMP3 cars yeah indeed so and uh, that's uh, what, what's interesting about that is this is a really hot pace I mean conditions right now at Subaru are absolutely perfect it, it's relatively cool only 60 odd degrees the track is pretty clean uh, the sun's out but it's not it's not too humid and uh, as a result of that Piper Durrani already has set a new race lap record the old standard was 1 minute 47.472 by Harry Ticknell a couple of years ago Piper Durrani had set the fastest lap last year here at Sebring at 147.6 he, on lap three, turned a 147.341. And even with, even as a result, even with that, the other the other Cadillac behind him and the two Accus are pretty much maintaining pace with him, as we saw also that change of the lead. So this is a very, very hot pace at the front of the field. Yeah, I, I'm making the most, I, I would say, Jeremy, of the, the more temperate conditions that we have here uh, this morning, as it still is at Sebring International uh, Raceway, with a, with a, a forecast that is uh, a lot more user-friendly for race cars and race tyres than perhaps earlier on in the week in terms of the temperatures. Yeah, as I was saying, exactly right. That's right. Yeah, it's perfect conditions right now. Absolutely glorious. The race cars and the drivers love these conditions. Whoops, Jimmy Johnson doesn't there. Now the spin for the 48. No damage to that car on the exit. Uh, no damage, excuse me, on the exit of turn number 17 and straight into the pits for the Allied Cadillac. Well, it's been a hard couple of days' work for the Action Express crew who were running this car. They had to effectively reshell that machine. Well, that was an odd one at turn 17. He was in the GT Daytonas. Uh, and catching up with a couple of cars, tries to go around the outside at turn 17. Ah, I see. Lost it on the bumps, and lucky actually not to have a bigger hit uh, from the car that he spun into. Uh, I think it was the Porsche of Faf Motorsport that uh, clipped 
the front of the car, although there was, although there was another prototype, Jeremy, in the vicinity of that, which I, I, I'm presuming was the LMP2 leader, was it? Yeah, I, I didn't actually see it, to be honest, but uh, it, it's uh, certainly not the way you want oh. to start the race, particularly. It was the Mustang Sam, it was Loic Duval, they were battling over 6th and 7th, and Jimmy was trying to take 6th position from Loic Duval. So In that case, he, he just lost that position because he had been ahead of Loic Duval. Loic Duval had fallen behind Jimmy at the start and, uh, and, and had remained so th through those first half a dozen laps or so. The back of, the back end of the number 48 Cadillac, the Allied car, has been a little feisty, I think it's fair to say. And it's been moving around. The bumps here are uh, pretty extreme, of course. That is the nature of Sebring International Raceway. And it's, it has been the back end of the car that Jimmy has uh, not had a handle on. He's trying to go wide around the heart of racing Aston and the Faf Porsche yeah. as he was coming through the final corner and got off the racing line. In fact, Faf makes the pass down the inside, so we had three wide at one stage. Jimmy trying to go around the pair of those fighting yeah. GT Daytona cars, and once you get off, well, certainly beyond the middle of the road there, Jeremy, uh, things get a bit wild pretty quickly because that's not a part of the racetrack that gets used uh, very often at all. No, and probably Jimmy's been <laughs> actually the only one who's been out there uh, during this weekend. That was yesterday when he crashed. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's really unfortunate. And as we can see from that replay, uh, Lloyd Duval was indeed still behind Jimmy Johnson. And as he came past in there with, when uh, the number 48 car was spinning, there was contact between the five and the and the number 48. So we have to see whether there's any damage to that number five car as well. But it certainly was not a good start by Lloyd Duval. And uh, he is either elected to stay Full behind Jimmy or wasn't able to find a way past. And the result of that, he fallen back a little bit. And now with that injury, yeah, there is damage to the left front yeah. nose cone on that number five car. There is a full course caution though, so uh, if they uh, deem it bad enough, they will probably bring that car in for a change of nose. So just over 15 minutes uh, gone and we have our first full course yellow and we see our Corvette C8 safety car for the first time. So it was indeed the Mustang sampling, number five Cadillac, that just clipped the front end. Very lucky, I would say, not to have done more damage to either of those cars. Catching a wheel or something like that could have been a suspension issue or a steering issue. This is all good news, however, for the Allied Cadillac because that does mean that that pit stop to change the front bodywork section has not cost them as much as it would have done without everybody getting packed up again. And remember, we do have the prototype split, so the DPIs go back to the front when we come round to restart. So effectively, he'll be back in seventh position, uh, exactly where he was when the car stopped rotating and came to a standstill at the, t the exit of turn 17. You're listening to IMSA Radio around the circuit on WWOG 99.1 FM on Sirius 216 and XM392 and around the world on RS2 via IMSAradio.com, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. And if you're outside of the States and your territory doesn't have a network TV deal, then you can watch full, live, uninterrupted video streaming coverage from the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring on... IMSAradio.com It's Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter in this first part of the race. Nick Damon will be joining in a wee bit later on. Jeremy Shaw is with me, John Hindoff in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. We are all socially distanced and uh, taking the correct precautions at the moment. Uh, I, th I think... It looks as the split is going on. Yeah, DPI class split. I think, Jeremy, that the front bodywork on that number five, just in front of the left front Michelin tyre, um, 
looks like they're not going to open the pits. I think they're going to have to make do with that for a while, but I, th I think that's doable, Jeremy. I don't think it's as, as bad, certainly, as it could have been. Uh, it, it doesn't look very nice, and it may have a small aerodynamic disadvantage on the left front, but my goodness me, we've, we've seen those kind of incidents with spinning cars coming into contact with a full-speed car behind caused all kinds of suspension and steering damage in the past. Yeah, and I, I would think they would want to bring this car onto pit lane just to have a look over it all and make sure that there is no other damage. I mean, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, these uh, these carbon fibre nose sections on these cars are pretty darn strong these days, but still, you're not sure what's what's been damaged behind it. Uh, it could damage the lights, could it damage even a brake duct or all sorts of things, and you don't want bits falling off the cars either. So uh, I would be surprised if they didn't bring that car onto pit lane and have a, a really good look over it and then uh, get back out into the race and you know they'll, they'll, they'll most likely they'll change it they'll, they'll have two or three spare nose sections in the pit lane and uh, i think the smart thing to do would be to, to change that by the way we are having uh, a slightly different procedure to what we're used to during the full course cautions in that all of the prototypes will go ahead of all of the gt cars prior to the restart that's a, a change for this race uh, and uh, also just a quick note here, uh, how, how, uh, how much does the traffic affect lap times? Well, uh, the, the, the lap before the caution period, the race leader's lap was a 1 minute 50 point, uh, point zero. The, uh, the fastest lap was a 147, so three seconds uh, on that particular lap was caused, was, was cost by, the, by working their way through the slower cars. And, and Sebring you know, isn't a track that is terribly bad really in terms of getting past slower traffic there's lot you know the straights uh, are various different points on the racetrack so they can get past the slower cars it's not like somewhere like var where you can be stuck all the way through the upper uphill s's and you can lose quite easily four or five seconds just through that one section of racetrack uh vp racing fuel pit paddock reporter uh, share adam keeping in touch with uh, what's going on and by the way thank you very much indeed to all of the uh, PR representatives from the teams, the manufacturers, and uh, also uh, from Michelin uh, and other IMSA suppliers for keeping the flow of information coming uh, in these uh, times that see very unusual working conditions. Uh, what are you hearing? This must be a quick yellow then. Uh, it was... It was just about 15 minutes, but not much more since the start of the race. But it looks to me as though we're not going to open the pit lane here. Correct. This is what is called a short full course yellow. So they do the pass round, they do the DPI class split, and then now they do the prototype class split. That is new to this race, but also new from this race forward and a rule that used to be in effect and now is in effect once again. The pits will not open until after all the cars have passed pit in for the first time after we go green. So in effect, do not follow the safety car into the pit lane. That will elicit you a drive through. Just a quick programme note for Tuesday, 1 o'clock Eastern. Another hour in sound and vision with Inside Track on the Haggerty community pages. Guests to be announced, but it will be some of the headline makers from this race this weekend. That's 1 o'clock Eastern. Uh, by then, that'll be 6 o'clock in the UK. That's Tuesday afternoon or evening depending where you are inside track on the Haggerty community pages back to green flag racing and do unto others as you would be done to by them well possibly people Durrani trying to make the pass at the first corner which is where he lost the lead to Renga van der Zander in the opening laps of the mobile 112 hours of Sebring just got caught up in a wee bit of traffic as we suspected and Renga van der Zander sweeping around the outside in a super manoeuvre. That's how the 0-1 Chip Ganassi Racing Cadillac, the sort of putty grey car, got into the lead. I wasn't able to perform that same manoeuvre, people, there. I apologise, our clocks don't change uh, in the UK at the weekend. It's another week of us only being uh, four in the UK uh, ahead of Easton. So that will be uh, five o'clock for Haggerty Inside Track on Tuesday. 
so once again battle is rejoined with this time Ricky Taylor holding third position and keeping the two leaders honest Oli Platt the very rapid Frenchman just another half a second behind in the number six zero Oli Jarvis Oliver Jarvis in the 55 and Jimmy Johnson now just a second and a half away from the top five so does that mean then that uh, Loic Duval came and went in the pit lane Shea Adams Yep, they came down the pit lane for a little bit of service. It's very rare that Ian Watt would get something wrong in the rule book, so I'm waiting to see the uh, penalty or lack thereof pop up on the race control channel. But it said very explicitly in the driver's briefing for this week, if you follow in the safety car, that is a drive through penalty. Uh, and also, by the way, a warning for the 48 crew improperly attired crew member during fueling. That is only a warning. It will be the only warning they get uh, it is a change of crew as Jeremy mentioned earlier on for the number 48 car and I believe they've brought uh, some of the guys from uh, from NASCAR over into that uh, into that pit lane uh, team share well we'll talk about that in a moment as Tom Milner is in the pit lane is this a penalty this was his penalty that he was issued off the start for changing lanes. He didn't serve it before the full course yellow came out. You cannot serve a penalty during a full course yellow. So this was Tommy Milner's next opportunity to do so. That penalty has now been served and everybody is all squared away. And I do apologize. Uh, I threw Ian Watt under the bus. He's not on the five. He is on the 31. So apologies, Ian. So he's, he hasn't, certainly hasn't had a penalty. That's one thing we, we can say. Let's check out some of the uh, battles further down the field. LMP, uh, LMP2 at the moment with Autosport leading by a couple of seconds in the number 11 with the number 11 car, Rasmus Lind in the 38 performance tech. What a week this young man has had, Jeremy, and leads in the Ligier. Uh, in the LMP3 category, and he's up among the LMP2 cars as well. Uh, his pace has been very good, the young man from Scandinavia. Just coming up to 11 and a half hours to go. So one full course yellow. Hopefully, we're going to get a nice long run because what we like to see at this early part of the race is just how everybody's fuel is playing out. We'll keep an eye on that so that we can start making predictions and back time from the end of the race. That's exactly what the teams will be doing. Good opening stanza for the two BMWs, Jesse Cron and Conor De Felipe. In fact, yes, he's got ahead of his teammates. 24 now from 25. The dark-coloured BMW M8 GTE is the number 24. The bright red one is the 25. Coming under the Mobile One walk over bridge now, down towards the hairpin at Turn 7. Just the Michelin Endurance Cup as it stands for BMW Team RLL. Waiting to find out what else they might be doing in the future. Uh, number four car back in the pits again, Shea Adam. This time it is a pit stop for Tommy Milner. He's going to be staying aboard the number four Corvette. They did a slight change in the driver's side door of that car. Interesting, and they're checking underneath the bottom in the splitter area. They did do fuel, no tires, but using the mechanics instead to examine the back end of the car. Fuel probe is removed, and Tommy Milner is sent back out. Well, that's a very odd one, very odd one indeed. The number four is the silver Corvette with the white racing stripes over the top and under the doors. The three has the uh, those areas in red, commemorating 25 years, the silver anniversary of their partnership with Mobile One. The fastest lap of LMP2 by Ben Keating for PR1 Matheson Motorsports, Jeremy, and that 
has turned into a full season for Ben Keating in LMP2. Good to see. Yeah, very good to see you. Absolutely right. And, uh, of course, he and Oliver Askew were the two main beneficiaries of that early full course caution because they had been... Uh, They've been lapped by the overall leader, but crucially not their, the respective class leaders. So therefore, during that full course caution, they were able to run around the uh, safety car and take up positions at the rear of the field in their respective classes. And now, uh, uh, Ben Keating is able to work his way up through the field. Now, he's, he's not only uh, back with the other two cars, but able to work his way forward again to uh, more represent the same with Oliver Askew in the 47 those thoughts kind of a seven. So really, really good news for those two. The 75 bright chrome green colourway uh, this weekend for the Sun Energy One team. And uh, that car started by Kenny Bull down in 10th position uh, at the moment. Great run at Daytona for the team, which is car being run by Gradient, Jeremy, and uh, they made quite an impression at the, the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And Kenny, I know, very impressed by that. Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Gradient's been running this series uh, for all, most of last year, at least all the sprint races, so, you know, they know what, exactly what to do, and no surprise there. Uh, they have done a good job, and uh, certainly that number 75 car was, uh, was a fantastic run for them at Daytona, finishing the second position, and looking for another strong result here. The Mercedes certainly looking, I think, pretty good. Uh, well, I think there's not much to choose between any of them, but Mercedes certainly was super strong at Daytona. For this race here, the balanced performance goes back to the end of last year because Daytona has its own specific uh, benchmark, if you like, in terms of the balanced performance. So it's not kind of relevant to the rest of the year. So a few changes for, uh, to the cars from Daytona, uh, and we're pretty much back to the specifications at the end of last year with a few little tweaks. The, the Lexus has a bit more weight. Actually, the Mercedes has a little bit more weight as well, uh, but to no major changes, I would say. Uh, a new fastest lap, and therefore a new lap record last time around for our race leader, Renga van der Sander, 146.651. That's not hanging around, is it? That's no. almost, that's eight, that's more than three quarters of a second inside the old TPI lap record. Uh, and only one in the top five that didn't do their best lap of the race last time around uh, was the number 60, Oli Pla in the Acura. So Pete Motorani, Ricky Taylor and Oli Jarvis all doing their best laps last time around. Now they just come round again uh, and we'll see if they can keep up that pace. But certainly Ricky Taylor can, he's just done a 47 flat. Uh, so that's two fastest laps of the race uh, for the number... 10 car, the blue and black car, in the last two laps. The people to Rani just closing the gap again down towards the front of the field, trying at least. Uh, took about uh, four tenths of a second out of Renga van der Zander, and the battle is back on again down at the hairpin. Top three still very much keeping an eye on each other. Let's uh, go to Shea Adam, who can update us on what was going on with Corvette Racing number four. Tom Milner, Tommy Milner down the pit lane twice. Once was a penalty, the second very much wasn't. Shea, what were they looking at under the back of the car? Well, remember that the engine is no longer where it used to be in the Ford Corvette? Um, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of uh, the word engine and issues being thrown around in the Corvette pit right now. It does not look good for Nick Tandy trying to get a fourth consecutive Sebring 12-hour GTLM win. The Mustang sampling number five Cadillac has been in the wars. Uh, first of all, that's... Uh, contact when Jimmy Johnson spun and speared across the track into their left front. The left rear now also getting a wee tag as it uh, was going through the GT Daytona traffic and in fact I think it was uh, Kenny Bull that they were, were going past so like to Val now with a couple of dings on the left hand side he's worked his way up to He's just outside the top 20 overall, but he'll be coming through that pretty quickly. Uh, he is in 23rd position last time that the timing screen updated when he went across the line. I'll keep an eye on that. 
tail end of the lead lap. Yes. Yes, good point, Jeremy. Good point. He, he, he's, he's pretty comfortable at the moment. He's uh, he's going into turn 10 as the leaders are coming around the hairpin at turn uh, turn 7. So, you know, he's got uh, uh, 10 seconds or so in hand over the overall race leader. So he, he, what, he, what he doesn't want to do, of course, at this stage is go a lap down. Yeah, his problem is in traffic, of course, he's lapping a good couple of seconds slower than Van der Zander and Durrani. However, this is endurance racing and they will catch that traffic as well. So they're going to get the pain that he is having right now in half a lap or a lap's time. Just having a listen to that Corvette engine as it goes through turn one, and it's not sounding as sharp as it should do. So, Shea, that's a, a cracking pickup from you. We'll keep an eye uh, on that and on the lap times of, of the number four GM Chevy Corvette. Tom Milner, Tommy Milner at the wheel of 59-1 last time around. So that is a couple of three seconds, Jeremy, off the pace of the rest of the uh, L, uh, the uh, Le Mans GTLM cars, sorry, uh, at the moment. So there's clearly something still awry with that number four car. Yeah, that's a shame, isn't it? Uh, and uh, that that uh, unlikely to to be able to come back from that. Uh, you know, he's already. Uh, I don't think he's actually been quite lapped by the uh, by the leader in in the class, but he's a long way back, and as you say, not up to speed at the moment. Well, she's been listening in to what's going on, and has this from the Corvette Racing Camp on the number four in this VP Racing Fuel Pit Paddock report. When he came to a stop, they had Tommy Milner do a full reset on the car, a full power reset. Tommy is actually reporting that the car feels a bit better, but as you said, still not quite back up to speed as of yet. A good distance ahead of his teammate leading the class right now. And with no traffic ahead of him on this lap, we'll have to see if Tommy can bring the lap time down anymore. But it was a scary couple of moments for the pole four crew. Yeah, uh, that's... It's like anything, isn't it? it? You know, your street car, if you have an intermittent fault that starts coughing and spluttering or misfiring, where do you start? It's not different on a race car. They can plug the computer in, they can do the diagnostics, but trying to replicate a problem sometimes very difficult uh, indeed. Renga van der Zander, uh, in the context of this race, has broken away a bit in the zero one. <laughs> Cadillac Chip Ganassi Racing DPI. He's got uh, 1.2 seconds on P. Portorani in second. He's got half a second on Ricky Taylor. They're working their way through traffic. They're into the GT Daytona field. The two Lexus uh, going another lap back as they get picked off. And this is what we're going to have now, Jeremy Shaw, for the next 11 and a half hours or thereabouts. Once we get into the rhythm of this race, traffic is going to be something you're going to have to deal with. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and we uh, love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Traffic and the bumps here. I mean, yeah, the cars move around a lot on this uh, Sebring surface, uh, and uh, you've got to anticipate what the car, the slower car, if you're ma making the, the, the move to go past, is going to do. And also, by the same token, when you're being overtaken, you, you've got to realise that the prototype that's going past you as a GT driver He's probably going to be moving around a lot more than he would, let's say, someone like Daytona, which is a lot smoother, of course. So, you know, all these little different factors are, are taken into account by the drivers, and that's what makes this such a uh, such a challenge. Uh, new fastest lap in uh, LMP2, by the way, by Ben Keating, who had worked his way past White Merriman, so now up into third position for the PR1 Matheson Motorsports number 52. And as I say that, Stephen Thomas, who leads the class, for win order sport economy 11 seventh overall he just reset the fastest lap 151.987 for stephen thomas remarkable story stephen i was going to say he's had a ago. good week this week as well hasn't he he's had a really yeah, good uh, week he has only had a horrible week one 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 week ago in the lmp3 car that he drives in the uh in the Inter prototype challenge series he's had a dismal time he just couldn't get his head around the speed the speed uh, limit in the pit lane apparently he had two or three penalties during the weekend uh, and he just wasn't particularly quick during a race either, whereas he had been uh, at Daytona and at last, towards the end of last year as well. But 
Uh, I, I texted him in the last night, and he just, he just likes the, the feels more comfortable in the NMP2 car, it seems. He likes the extra power, the extra downforce. And for somebody with so little experience, he is doing a pretty remarkable job to lead that category at the moment. Pit stop for number 31. Uh, yes, that is Pete Durrani. Now, we're 40 minutes in, which would be around about the right time for DPI stops, but we have had uh, some yellow flag. That's only 18 laps, and three of those were under the safety car. Shea Adam has this VP Racing Fuel Pit report. Four new tyres for Pipo Durrani and a lot of fuel. My first instinct, John, was to look at the Michelin Endurance Cup points to see if the 31 might be back timing to that. Nope, they're well out of it after Daytona. Uh, half the points of the championship leader, as a matter of fact, as far as that's concerned, waiting on fuel. Perfect pit stop by the Whalen engineering crew to get the tires done well ahead of time. I don't, think the, I, I don't think the left front wheel's on properly. Let me get a quick look at that again. It, it might have just been an optical illusion through the catch fencing, but that looked a bit weird to me. Well, no, stayed on. That's it pulls out how very odd now he's got up to speed maybe there was a bit of tape, tape on it or something that was just catching my eye he's weaving around trying to get heat into the Michelin tires that is because he uh, that you're not allowed to warm the tires at all no blankets no heating cabinets you can leave them out in the sun that's about all you could do you could have a you could have a mechanic sit on one I suppose that might help um, so <laughs> That's either a very early stop to, to take him out of uh, kilter with everybody else here, or maybe with the debris that we had at 17, maybe the people was feeling something in, in, in the tyres. Yeah, I, I can't see why they would do an early stop as far as strategy is concerned, unless that they wanted him to spend less time in the pit lane. But I say that he's now followed in. He started a trend. Oliver Jarvis is into the pit lane in the 55 Mazda as well. So that car, which uh, was the winning car from this race, what, four months ago, in the hands of Harry Tinknell and Jonathan Bomarito, now gets Oliver Jarvis, and they too are doing fuel tires. And by the looks of it, a drinks bottle change for Ollie. So maybe he's working hard out there too yeah it, it, it's a little bit short particularly having had those uh, yellow flags jeremy but on time it's roundabout right it will give them of course an idea of, of fuel burn because they'll know exactly how much ha has gone into the car mazda adding their name to the illustrious hall of fame of manufacturers who have won outright at the mobile 112 as of sebring and all of those manufacturers are chronicled in uh, in you know, chronological order uh, on the top of the pit boxes underneath the hospitality suite uh, Mazda very proud to have added their name to that illustrious uh, list Rengo of der Zander then by five seconds now to Ricky Taylor in second for Konica Minolta at Europe uh, the top three yet to make their pit stops we would have said around about 40 minutes Jeremy for a, a, a full green run so we're not a million miles away there are we oh no 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 we're we're, we're right on there and uh, you know it's that's that should that's i don't think there's anything untoward there uh, at all and share the pit stops continue more pit callers this time in the form of the race leader. Renger van de Zin with the shiny gold helmet for this weekend. He stepped it up from the normal yellow. Both his kids and his wife were at the track, by the way. So hello to Lux and Molex. I'm sure you guys are listening in. Four new tires for Renger, as well as they're waiting for him, actually. They didn't give him a new drinks bottle. They gave him a bottle with uh, some fluid in it so that he could drink during the pit stop. Very handy bit of uh, work going on there from the Chip Canassi racing crew and the Cadillac has new wheels on it just waiting for the air gun and the fuel to be pulled out further up the pit lane we've got the 10 that is Ricky Taylor who started that car qualified it on second and then moved back down the grid a little bit thanks to the help of Ranger off the start fuel and tires as well for Ricky he also is staying aboard and we have the bright pink Acura in the pit lane that is the MSR car it was started by Olivier Pla taken back out of the pit lane by Olivier Pla and this means that Jimmy Johnson has cycled to the front of the field. And, of course, because he 
came into the pit lane for that repair on the nose, he's only been out for this being his 15th lap. So I reckon he's got probably another five or six laps of fuel, Jeremy, before he needs to uh, answer the call for fuel and come down in the pit lane. Race off pit road. And the two Acuras, the 10 and the 60, getting very, very close indeed as they came out into traffic at the uh, exit of the pit lane at turn one. But no harm, no foul, just about no harm, uh, no foul as they came back up to racing speed with the new Michelin tyres are on. But as they come round this time, Jimmy Johnson will be scored uh, as the leader. It was pretty tight going into the pit lane as well. Ah, I see what happened going into the pit lane. The 0-1 actually overtook the 6-0. Oli Pla breaking a little bit earlier coming into the pit lane. They hadn't hit the pit lane speed line yet, so that was a nice piece of opportunist driving by Renga van der Zander on the way in, he, but he got done he, on the way out. He'd been ahead of the 60. Certainly looked like he overtook them on the pit lane entry. Um, but hey ho. Uh, but they've come out, they've come out with Pla ahead of uh, von der Zander. Uh, sorry, uh, with uh, Pla, I'll do that the way around. They've come back out with Ricky Taylor ahead of Oliver Pla. Yeah, that's the way, that's the order they came right. in. They came in the order 01-10-60. Oh, big, big hit for the 31. That was three wide going into turn number 17 traffic playing apart again and straight into the pits the wins LMP car following them in the LMP2 car and that's dive planes off the left front of people Durrani's car now people was trying to make up a position there and there was three cars trying to get in a space where really only one was going to fit that'll be I think at the very least, in, actually, I thought he'd lost one of the dive planes, so maybe that wasn't his that went flying. But immediately, another set of tyres, on at least on the left rear of that car. Uh, and remarkably, well, right sides, both right sides have been looked at, and there's obviously been a, a bang on the nose cone because it looks like they're going to try and take the nose cone off, and this is not a simple fix by the look of it. I think he's broke suspension, broken suspension there, Shea. I think you're right, John. They are signaling that they need to take the nose off of this car. Unfortunately, there's just no urgency among anybody in the pit lane. I'll let you look at the replay. It was the 0-1 uh, and squeezed down from the outside with the heart of racing. Aston Martin, one of two GTD cars, looked like the right Porsche as well in that and this is endurance racing this is multi-class endurance racing people had the run down the inside but unfortunately the aston was turning in had to turn in at some stage couldn't just keep going straight on and that squeezed everybody into the inside wall there was a tiny lock up from renga van der zander on the right front and that is suspension damage at the right front of one of the favorites the paul sitting car share adam getting remedial work yeah, this is quite a bit of suspension work going on to the right front of this car. Looks like maybe a, an A-arm or a wishbone that has bent in the wrong direction. But two mechanics going to work at the front of the car. I wonder what's going on at the rear of this car and also about the knock that it had from the other side because there was contact with both sides, the other side, the left side being another car. There are mechanics working on the right rear of this vehicle as well. So the Cadillac getting a lot of attention from all of the people allowed over the wall. Remember, this is the Whalen Engineering crew that we are used to. This is the group that knows the car, so they'll be able to get this fixed as quickly at done as they can, whereas the other car might not be the same situation. I don't think you can apportion blame there, Jeremy, as that was going. That was That's just, you know, almost the definition of a racing incident. Durrani's committed very early on in the piece here, and the gap that he's in is just getting narrower and narrower. And in fact, he clipped the wall on the right-hand side because he'd run out, run out of space completely. No wonder that's done the steering and the suspension. I totally agree with you, John. Yeah, it was just one of those things. I mean, you know, people are, it's early in the race. 
Um, Pippa Durrani, of course, you know, being a, in a low-slung prototype, he might not even have seen the Aston Martin because the closing speeds between the DPIs and the GTD cars is pretty immense. He was already to the inside of the 0-1 car trying to make that pass. He probably never even saw the number 23 Aston Martin. That, it therefore, comes down to the spotters. Most of the teams, I think, have a spotter uh, in or around turn 17. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it, it was really, as you exactly, I think you've got it absolutely right. It was just one of those things. If there was any blame at all, uh, it, I guess you'd have to put it on, thir on number 31 car because uh, he was trying to make a move on there. It was some somebody who clearly didn't want to be passed because Renko van der Zender was clearly defending the inside line there. So I think Pipo might have been a little bit more circumspect there and just pulled out of that, trying to make the pass uh, a little bit earlier. But uh, really, really unfortunate for that number 31 team, and that's going to cost them a lot, a lot of time. Just want to correct something earlier on. The car that Renger van der Zander uh, overtook coming into the pits was the United Autosports LMP2 car. That was uh, Mark, who's wound back or saw it better at the time. Thank you very much indeed. There was definitely an overtake coming in, and it was... Uh, the United car, the number 22. Thank you, Mark, for that. At IMSA Radio, hashtag RSL Sebring. Say again, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, there are a whole bunch of cars coming down in the, into into that corner at the same time. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Busy, and, busy, and, and, busy. and the thing is, you know, it's the old Michael Schumacher thing, isn't it? You don't really want to break uh, any earlier than you have to for the pit lane speed line. It's it's wasted time, like as if you break too early for a corner, Jeremy. You can gain and lose a lot of time coming in and out of the pits. Yeah, yeah, you, you can indeed. So you, you've got to be, uh, you know, you, yes. <laughs> really unfortunate though for the number 31 car because that was a really, really quick car. Uh, you know, got off to a, a flying start from the pole position, but now they're going to be uh, quite a few laps down. And, you know, uh, there certainly is the propensity for full course yellows, which is going to give the opportunity to gain a lap back each time per hat. Never, never sure of that, of course, depending on where they are in the pit stop cycle for each of the cars. But uh, it's going to be a long, long way back now, and that is uh, not good for their championship uh, aspirations, of course. And, you know, they were running so well at Daytona, they had problems there in the later stages. Now, of course, it's in the early stages here at Sebring. Uh, we've just gone past uh, the clock hour here at Sebring International Raceway. So let's give you uh, an in-race update from Mazda. Top of the shop is Jimmy Johnson, who is yet to make the corresponding pit stop that everyone around has. He's uh, on his 19th lap. He'll get uh, 21 uh, or 22 laps out of that tank of fuel. And we'll have an update from Shea on that car in a wee moment. He's got 38 seconds because of that pit stop deficit on second place, Rangan van der Zander in the 0-1 Cadillac Chip Ganassi racing car, the putty-coloured car, as I've been calling it. Uh, Ricky Taylor won the battle of the Acuras off the pit lane speed limiter, so the 1-0 is ahead of the 6-0. Oli Pla is in fourth position for MSR. Oli Jarvis in the Mazda is uh, 55 in fifth position. And he's another two and a half seconds further back. And Loic Duval makes up the top six in the slightly damaged Mustang sampling JDC Miller Motorsport Cadillac dark grey number five. LMP3, Rasmus Lin for performance tech is in seventh overall and leads his category by some margin, actually. Carl Robinson in second place is down in 15th position. So an awful lot of cars uh, between... Uh, those two in GT Le Mans it's Tonio Garcia who is leading for Corvette racing problems early on for the number four Corvette but his uh, team in the number three with the uh, red stripes on it is going very nicely indeed ahead of two BMWs Jesse Cron in the dark coloured number 24 M8 and his teammate Conor De Filippi. Both of those drivers, all of the drivers have been in since the start. The 25 car in third position, the bright red car. Just, uh, by the way, under a second now between the Corvette and the second car, that uh, BMW of Jesse Crom. LMP2, 11th overall for the win Autosport car. Tim Thomas doing a cracking job, has about a second on the PR1 Matheson Motorsport number 52. Ben Keating still at the wheel of that. 
43 seconds further back uh, is the Tower Motorsport number eight, uh, Origa LMP2. And in GTD, uh, down in 24th position, it is now a Lexus that leads in the hands of Aaron Tielitz. Ahead of his teammate, Frank Monte Calvo, by a second and a half, 14 from 12 in the two yellow and black Lexus RCF GT3s. In third place, Daniel Morad for Mercedes AMG and the Allegra Motorsports number 28 car. He's about a second and a half further back and has about the same on Robbie Foley in the Turner Motorsport number 96 BMW M6. And the top six in GTT made up by the number one Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini, Madison Snow on board there, and the blue Wright Motorsports Porsche after its start infringement back up to sixth position after the drive through for Jan Halen uh, in the 16 car. And he's uh, just a tenth of a second further back. Leader is in the pit lane, so that is your Mazda in race update. Still five minutes before the first hour of racing is done. Into the pit lane for Jimmy Johnson. Remember, off kilter on fuel, so has gone seven or eight laps further than the set of pit stops that corresponded to that from the other leading runners. Shea Adam, you've been watching that Ally Cadillac quite carefully over the last few laps. Yes, and he is about six minutes short of meeting minimum drive time. So Jimmy Johnson will need to do another stint in the Allo Racing Cadillac. But that's not right now because Simon Pagano has taken over behind the wheel of that car. Though it was very interesting with what was going on with Action Express. They run two cars in the field. The other car, besides the 48, being that 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac that was on the pit lane receiving work. They didn't want to bring the 48 in while the 31 was still there, blocking the egress of Jimmy Johnson and into the pit box so they waited and they kept Jimmy out for a couple laps longer to be able to make sure that the 31 was going to stay out get out and stay out excuse me on that so that was uh, interesting and of note that Pippo Durrani was only on lap for a on track for a few laps on those new Michelin tires then they put another set of Michelin tires onto the car so John what was one of our Porsche keys to the race and uh, the tires and the tires yeah have some at the end, pit stops now starting for the GT classes. Shea Adam with the two BMWs coming in in team orders. With 24 leading in 25, that is the black BMW that started in fourth place for Yessi Krohn. Let's see if Yessi's going to be staying aboard that car. He's been doing quite a bit of snow rally driving back home in Finland. Now he gets to come back and do some proper uh, concrete racing in the U.S. Connor Filippi behind him, both drivers staying aboard, both drivers getting fuel and brand new Michelin tires. Uh, just in case... You missed that. Jimmy Johnson did get out of that number 48 car after a 21-lap uh, run since his fuel stop uh, in that uh, Cadillac number 48. Renga van der Zander retakes the lead in the Chip Ganassi version of the Cadillac, the 0-1 Ooh. car. Shit. A change on the pit lane. The 25 crew beats out the 24. So red BMW now leads black BMW. And uh, also a quick note, we did have the LMP3 leader down the pit lane. Performance Tech doing their first stop of the race. Rasmus Lind, who had run out to a fantastic lead at the beginning of this one, stays aboard the red and black LMP3 machine. Yeah, uh, none of the other cars in that category have yet made their stops. Uh, dropped down to fourth in class, 18th overall, and uh, Rasmus then getting back up to speed on a lovely, lovely day here at Sebring International Raceway. A little bit of high cloud, uh, air temperature spot on at 20 Celsius. And that, for those of you who work in Fahrenheit, is 68 degrees. And it's about a degree or two warmer on the track temperature. Barely any wind to talk about. It was quite windy early on this week, actually. And that was causing uh, some problems for the drivers, getting their braking points right, particularly in the prototypes. Not just the prototypes, but more particularly the aero-dependent cars. 
Mm. Frankly, even the GD3 cars are pretty aero dependent nowadays. So coming round to the first full hour of racing completed. As, uh, coming into the pits a moment or two ago, the 24 BMW going round the outside of that was the Corvette and then cutting right in front. Now we've got the WeatherTech Porsche coming in as well from GT Le Mans here. And again, short on drive time, Cooper McNeil cannot put his feet up for the rest of the day. He still needs two more minutes until you've reached the minimum one hour drive time, but that doesn't stop them from doing a driver change for the 79 WeatherTech Racing. That was the helmet of Matthew Jaminet getting behind the wheel. So the Frenchman going out for his first stint during this year's race. But uh, we have also had into the pit lane John Bennett in the 54 Core Autosport LMP3 machine, as well as Lance Wilsey and Sean Freach LMP3 machine, that one, the number 33. Uh, Brian Sellers is now in the number one Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. And Mikhail Grenier is in the 75 Sun Energy One machine being run by Gradient Racing. Uh, another pit stop also, Christina Nielsen stays aboard the 88 for Hardpoint Team EBM in that Porsche. A few moments ago, just a little off at turn 10 for Jim Cox in the Riley Motorsport Leash here, fifth in LMP3 at the moment. That's the number 91 car, but he has uh, continued in to the pit lane for the GTD Lamborghini and Paul Miller racing and that was a driver change there and that's Brian Sellers I think that's got into that car she yes correct thank you so cycling through this early part of the race with one full course yellow debris on the track caused by a spinning Jimmy Johnson in his Cadillac and then spearing across the track and clipping the left front of the Mustang sampling car, that left debris on the track that needed attention. Shards of carbon fibre and Michelin tyres, uh, not the best friend, let's be honest. And this is quite a quick track, let's uh, remind ourselves. Corvette in the pit lane is the number three with the red flashes. Shea Adam, this is the one that has been leading uh, GT Le Mans. This is the last of our pit stoppers as well for the GTLM category. Let's see, is it still the King of Spain? It is Antonio Garcia not removing himself from that car. It should surprise absolutely no one. Fuel tires, oh, I like the mobile one sticker that they've got on the side of the car. They've got the flying horse, the Pegasus, as extra representation of the silver liveries that they're doing this year, which, by the way, in case you're seeing these pictures for the first time all weekend and thinking, hang on, where's the yellow Corvettes? Well, there is still some yellow on the three Corvette at the very least because Antonio Garcia from Spain has a Spanish flag on that car. But yes, different livery for Mobile One, and Antonio Garcia is back out on the track for what he hopes will be another hour. Uh, and just for this race is what we're being told by Corvette Racing Shear. Yes, correct, just for this race. So get used to it over the next 10 hours and 58 minutes, but then you probably won't see it again. So, Jeremy, an hour of racing completed. One full course yellow for that incident we've just uh, mentioned. And Renke van der Zander, that cream sort of just cream coloured car as well has risen to the top for Cadillac Chip Ganassi Racing uh, yes and um, the, 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 the we've had what three lead changes in this race we've had three different leaders and Rega van der Zander turning into good laps at the front of the field he's maintaining that gap around about five seconds actually gone out, went out of, by, by more than a second on that last lap over Ricky Taylor in second place, 6.6 .6 seconds. Uh, a similar margin back to Oli Klein, second of the Acuras for my, my Shank Racing in third position. Oliver the Jarvis is uh, tracking along behind him just a couple of seconds back. So they're all running a similar pace. Number five car has just made its second pit stop of the day. Of course, out of sequence with everybody else as a result of having to make that stop earlier on during the caution period uh, as a result of the uh, the uh, contact that it was involved in with the number 48 car in the early stages so uh, number five car they're back on schedule now or its schedule slightly off kilter with every with the other dpi cars but that stop has been made and Lloyd de Val back out onto the racetrack and he will be in the sixth position we've got just the uh, top six cars all the prototypes are on the lead lap and everybody else is a lap down Stephen Thomas still leads in LMP2 and he's maintaining a gap of around about three seconds over Ben Keating in second place in the car number 52. That gap again remaining fairly constant. Yeah, just getting into the rhythm now. 
now we're going to just have to keep our eye on who's doing what at the front of the field. As Jeremy mentioned, Simon Pagino and that I like Cadillac just a little bit off kilter to everyone else. Been some GTD stops now as we're getting into the time, around about an hour for the GT Daytona cars and the GT Le Mans. We had a little bit of yellow that's just uh, stretched out a wee bit. Share what's going on. Uh, lots of driver changes in GTD, which is something that we don't normally see. So clearly people trying to get all their drivers cycled through and give everyone a chance to feel what the track conditions are like. Uh, we mentioned Brian Sellers is now in the number one. Lars Kern has taken over for Zach Robichon. Great job by Zach in that opening stint to come back up from 12th. At one point, he was running in the sixth. Robert McGinnis is aboard the 12 Lexus. And Kyle Kirkwood just now strapping himself aboard that number 14, the sister car Lexus, which pitted from second. Trent Hinman is aboard the right motorsport portion, number 16. And Tim Zimmerman, who set the fastest lap in qualifying yesterday, only to have that time disallowed due to the car not passing the technical inspection, has climbed aboard the 19 GRT Lamborghini. Ian James is the only driver I've seen so far who has stayed aboard the GTD machine that he started the car in. It's Michael De Casada who is now in the Allegra Motorsports Mercedes. First time all year for Michael to be driving in racing conditions, of course. Uh, John Potter is just in the pit lane now for the Magnus Racing Acura, so I'll keep an eye on that. It's Mikkel Grenier aboard the 75 Sun Energy One. Uh, Christina Nielsen also did stay aboard the number 88 Porsche, and I'm waiting. Uh, Rob Ferriel has stayed aboard the 99. So we have three of our original 13 drivers who have not changed out as it is now uh, eight and three in the 96 Turner Motorsport BMW. That is a lot of changes for the first round of pit stops. We do not normally see that. Hello to Steph, who's finally made it into the circuit. Lots of people wanting to see the 69th running of the Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring, presented by Advance Auto Parts. At least she was able to keep uh, up to date with what was going on. Sirius 216, XM 392, around the area of the circuit on WWOJ here in Central Florida, 99.1 FM, and around the world on RS2. That's the home of IMSA Radio. Every single hour of every single day of the week, month, uh, or year, there's IMSA content on there. And if you're in a territory uh, outside the US or ones that don't have network television, you can... Watch the pictures without any interruption and with our IMSA Radio commentary on imsaradio.com. Just click on the uh, live video tab on the top left-hand side. Take us, with, take us with you wherever you're going today on this Saturday. With just under 11 hours to go. It's uh, Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, Jeremy Shaw and me, John Hindhoff, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Little sharp intake of breath as GT action coming on to the back straight takes my interest immediately this is GT Daytona mixed in with GT Le Mans and Trent Hinman uh, with the what was the Paul sitting right motorsport Porsche he's got a couple of Vassa Sullivan Lexus either side of him McGinnis behind him Kirkwood ahead of him and further up the road, it's the Turner Motorsport BMW that is now leading that GTD class. That's a, that's a decent little scrap going on there, Jeremy, with the uh, GT Le Mans cars coming through it as well. Yeah, fun, wasn't it? Uh, we got a great, uh, treated to a great overhead shot of the cars going down the Alacolman straight and really interesting to see all the speed differential between the cars. You know, I think the best battle out on the racetrack at the moment, for, for position at least, is for the GTLM lead, the three leaders pretty much nose to tail. Number three, uh, Corvette still leads, but the two BMWs right there, Corin D. Felipe in number 25, the red car, and uh, Jesse Krohn in a 24 uh, sister car as well. That's a good little battle, those three cars very, very close together. And uh, Matthew Jaminet, as Shay described earlier on, is taking over the wheel of the number 79 WeatherTech Porsche run by the Proton competition team, but he's a, a half a minute or so behind uh, the three leaders in GTLM, but uh, half a minute at this stage of the game means absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, what? in LMP2, all of a sudden, uh, excuse me, John, the, uh, uh, Ben Keating has all of a sudden just caught right up to uh, Stephen Thomas as well, so number 11 and number 52, both of the first two cars are lapped down to the overall leaders, are now together and battling for the lead in LMP2. 
And if you'd like to join the conversation, at IMSA Radio, hashtag RSL Seabrief is how you get in touch with us. Already boiling up to be very interesting indeed at the sharp end of all of the different classes. Very early days. I'm sure what we can read from what we've seen other than everybody uh, wants to wanted to get back racing as early as possible. They even had some penalties right off the start uh, for people being a little over-anxious and changing lanes. But at the moment, it is Renke van der Zander for Cadillac Chip Ganassi Racing, the number 01 that leads the way. Remember, uh, Renga was last in the pits some 14 and a bit laps ago. He's probably got another six or seven. So that's 12, between 12 and 14 minutes away, isn't it, for his next stop. Exactly the same time for Ricky Taylor. Although the Acura did get... Both of the Acuras uh, got a lap longer than the... Cadillac, no that's not true actually, no he got the same number of laps as the Cadillac, one more than the Mazda on that last run with a bit of yellow in it but uh, if you are doing your own lap chart as Jeremy will be doing 20 to 21 laps of green is where you expect those prototypes to be around about 38 to 40 minutes depending on the track conditions on the green flag running. Pagenaud then down to the hairpin at turn seven. Got the great GRT Lamborghini to go through. Slips to the right hand side through turn eight, the kink. And now into turn nine and ten. A bit of a lock up ahead and gathering clouds. Forecast was for a little cloudy skies as we got towards the evening time they don't look too threatening at the moment still quite high and spaced out although there's a little bit of darkness in them they're not white fluffy clouds he's the leader across the line Renga van der Zander then clocks up another lap completes 36 and that's a new lap record Jeremy it is indeed 146.638 then for Ranga van der Zender again. We said this several times now. The old record that was set a couple of years ago, 147.4. So significantly quicker now for the. Uh, this is the Cadillac Chip Ganassi Racing uh, car that uh, is running in the lead of this race. The gap back to second place, around about five seconds. That's uh, staying pretty constant back uh, eight laps ago. It was, it was five seconds also. So uh, as they, it ebbs and flows a bit uh, so as they work their way through the traffic, but that's staying fairly constant. In your third place car, however, Oli Clark is definitely falling back a bit. Uh, they were, uh, it was about similar margin behind in third position. That's now doubled to 11 seconds from second to third. But Oli Jarvis, uh, he had actually caught up to Oli Clark, just fell back a, a little bit on this last lap as he had negotiates slower traffic. Uh, in LMP2, Ben Keating has now taken the lead from Stephen Thomas. So it's number 52 car that leads in in LMP2. Uh, in uh, the next bit on the racetrack is the GT LM confirms top three cars still put the close tail in 25 and 24. In LMP3, behind those three GT LM leaders, Lazarus Lind still leads. Still leads the LMP3 Category 4, the uh, South Florida-based team for the SEC Motorsports. And he's got about yeah, probably half a minute in hand over Oliver Askew. So in the kind of a 747 Motorsports, that's the Duquesne. And I spoke to Oliver yesterday, last night, and uh, he's not particularly comfortable in the handling of that Duquesne chassis in 47 Motorsports. And he's rather hoping that the experience that uh, Stephen McAleer has in that car will help him as the best to maintaining their grid positions from the start. Gar Robinson doing a really nice job in the third place in the class for Riley Motorsports, car number 74. He's only about five seconds behind all the brass, so that's a really stout effort for Gar Robinson in car number, L, in car number uh, 74. In GTD, well, uh, yeah, Kirkwood pulled out just a little bit of a gap, still that number 14 car that leads now. Uh, we should mention that the number 16 car, Trent Hidden, was taken over the wheel of that right motorsports car. That was another big beneficiary 
from that uh, for early full course caution because you remember number 16 car had to serve a penalty shortly after the start of the race for being uh, out of position. I think it was at the start. Uh, so uh, that car had fallen a long way back but uh, got back up into contention. And we've seen how fast that number 16 car is because yes. uh, Jan Hayden put it on pole position for the second time in as many races here at Sebring. And uh, that car now up into second place in the 16 Porsche in GTD, John. Yeah, he changed his lanes at the start, didn't he? And chopped across actually in front of a, a GT Le Mans Porsche. In, uh, and that's what got him the, the drive through penalty. But as you say, they've made that back now. And the funny thing about that is it looked, it looked from our perspective, that the, the, the prototype start was the messier of the two. It was compared... untidy, I'll give you that, yes. Yeah, it was. So, you know, they were all spread out. Kind of, kind of, where they were in relation to the other guys with the cars, we kind of shuffled up the couple of penalties at the start for being out of position. And the four Corvette being one as well. Hello to Jamie McEwen, enjoyed the first hour. Uh, he decided he needs a chocolate hobnob early to keep up the energy levels. You've got to pace yourself with that, Jamie. If you go for the chocolate hobnobs this early, you might be struggling uh, later on. That wasn't part of our portion keys to the uh, race, in fact, but uh, intake through through the race for everybody, including those spectating and working. James Brown asks on at IMSA Radio using the hashtag RSL Sebring. What's the red implement sticking up from the 48's bonnet? Uh, or the hood. You can clearly see it in the onboard shot. I think that's the towing eye, Shea, isn't it? Uh, yes, and, and also in terms of the driver, that is the uh, fire here, the missile towing <laughs> thing that they use. Yeah. Uh, no, it is the towing. It's hood. the sight. It's the, uh, it's yes. the gun sight. Yes, no, it's the towing eye, uh, which is uh, sticking up. Uh, some of the cars, that's lays flat, and it, and it can be pulled up and locked up with a pin. Uh, it just so happens that on that one, uh, it's up all the time, uh, and that's why you can say it's here. It, it should be flat, but his spin has actually knocked it up, ah. and the team didn't put it back down. Uh, normally, you don't get that sticking straight up into the air, but every time a prototype spins, you do tend to see those tow hooks uh, rising and shining and then staying up for the remainder of the race. So that, James, is what you were asking about the number 48, the Cadillac. And uh, that is what it is. That's what it's there for. Hopefully it won't be required. So our Porsche keys to the race, you heard uh, me make mention of that then, uh, is be there in the dark and that's a problem now Jeremy Shaw for the pool sitting car which is dropped somewhere near 14 miles behind uh, the leaders or if you prefer four laps behind the leaders and that is going to be tough that's going to make this next 10 and three quarter hours very long they're going to have to use every single opportunity to get laps back should there be a full course yellow again yeah, that's right. I mean, a super job, really, by that uh, number 31 team to lose only four laps uh, with that uh, suspension uh, change they had to make on the number 31 car. Uh, he's not so sure where he is on the racetrack, actually, just trying to find him on the uh, March Yancey. He can't actually see it at the moment. But I, I don't think he's uh, close to being able to get uh, one of those laps back. So, yeah, he is going to need the help of the... Uh, coming on the back Norton, straight now, sure. Jeremy. Um, and uh, thanks you to Alicia, who's just punched up the on board from the number 31 of Pipo Durrani. Sits in 24th position then. Uh, and, and he make up some positions there because he's got LMP3s and GT cars on the same lap as him. He's got a whole, he's got from seventh down to uh, fourth in LMP3 on the same lap that he is working at the moment as he goes into turn one and commits so quick now into turn one isn't it really is for these dpi cars so he will make up some positions on the timing and scoring monitors but he's not going to improve for quite some time or unless anyone else hits problems in his own category so he's staying in seventh uh, for quite some time the leader by the way uh, is the zero one and 
that car is well people's just gone through the hairpin and the leader is coming to the hairpin about now so that'll give you an idea of uh, how much ground people has to make there are people who are driving very quickly though including the engine that you can hear uh, behind us which is well, actually that might not be the right engine but uh, that's simon Pagino in the ally cadillac that's the number 48 car that has just done another new fastest lap which means another lap record yeah, indeed. So uh, clearly, uh, we, we, Jim Johnson was clearly struggling uh, at, before uh, handing over that car because there was that damage on the front of the car. They, they changed the nose and joined that pit stop, and now Simon Pagano is showing the true speed of that car. So it's just a new fastest lap of the race, as you say, John Hyde, number 146.512. Boy, the, the, uh, the pace of this race is fast. Conditions are perfect. Drivers are absolutely loving it out there right now. A new uh, fastest lap for their race for Stephen Thomas in the win Autosport LMP2 car. It's number 11, Orica, 151.2 there so some of the drivers absolutely loving these conditions at the moment as jeremy says uh, dwight berryman heading to the pit lane for era motorsport Shea adam the number 18 origa is in the pit lane and this is on time this is triggering the next round of stops for our lmp2 contenders we should be getting our dpi contenders down the pit lane shortly as well since they've been on track for about 38 minutes for the longest of them that's a couple of laps early for Murray, but he's, he's well, only just completed, well, oh, maybe one no, lap early. It's, Not eight, eight it's strategy. It's strategy. They're going to pull Dwight out of that car and put Razzle Dazzle in for his next stint. Yeah. So this will be the first time that we see the Flying Scotsman around the track. And uh, hello to Kyle Tilly, who's listening in to us right now. They're enjoying a little bit of pasta in the RV, saving up strength for his first stint later on. I yeah, wonder what secret is going to tell us today that he hasn't told his uh, PR machine. Uh, <laughs> he can let that one uh, out of the bag. Also coming in the 6-0 MSR car, uh, and that is uh, spot on. That's a, a, another 19, 20 lap stint for Oli Pla, Jeremy. Yeah, uh, uh, so absolutely right, not on schedule there. Uh, super first, first stint there by Dwight Merriman, by the way, in the number 18 car car that won the course at uh, Daytona and he was you know, holding his own there in the third position he was yeah, 15 seconds or so behind the, the two leaders but after 40 laps you know very very good effort by uh, Dwight Merriman good good job by him and that would be Razzle Dazzle as Shay Adam tells us Ryan DL for those that don't know spin down at the hairpin uh, and that is turn number seven on your track map, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and that is the Sean Creech Motorsport number 33 in its red, white and blue colours. Uh, facing the wrong direction and would appear without any fire in the V8. Now it's fired up, now it's moving uh, forwards. And Lance Wilsey has got a bit of grass tracking onto the old circuit and heads back out the right way around the track don't think there was any contact there but I don't know how he ended up facing in the wrong direction in the first place whether uh, he was helped slightly front of the field then starting their pit stops again uh, and it's Ricky Taylor and Ollie Jarvis for Acura number 10 from Conning and Minolta and Mazda Motorsports number 55 Shea Adam last time that we had pit stops the Acuras were in together this time the MSR Acura coming in a lot before the Conning Minolta Acura this Again, no driver change. So Ricky Taylor going back out for another stint behind the wheel of the glossy black Acura. I pause there to give people a little bit of pause. And uh, also further down in the Mazda world, the 55 is into the pit lane. Oliver Jarvis bringing that car in. I believe the plan was to leave him aboard for another stint, but we'll have to wait and see when he triggers the pit out. Also into the pit lane of note was the number four Corvette of Tommy Milner. This one is the silver with the white accents on it. And Tommy, I believe, will be staying aboard that car as well. Uh, and for those that follow these things, Ollie Jarvis uh, did a lap further on that tank of fuel than he did on the previous one uh, and uh, so that's interesting uh, Ollie Pla did uh, a lot fewer on that tank of fuel than he did uh, on the previous one Simon Pagino with about five more laps to go will be the last of the leaders uh, to stop in that alley 
uh, Ally Cadillac, uh, number uh, number 48, as Renga van der Zander heads to pit lane in the leading Cadillac, and that was a 20, another 21 laps. So that is uh, exactly the same as he did last time around. This should be full service this time around for that car ship. It should be, but let's see if Ranger stays aboard or if they decide to find a crowbar and try and get him out of the car. <laughs> He's sharing this 01 Cadillac Chip Ganassi racing, beautiful race car with none other than Scott Dixon and Kevin Magnuson, rookie to the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sabre. You can't often say rookie when you associate Kevin Magnuson, but fuel tires and away the car goes. Uh, is that still a gold helmet? I no. think that's still a gold oh, helmet. Is. Yes, no, you're right, it is. I just saw the the flash uh, of the sunshine on there. So Renga, um, not good at sharing, clearly. We knew that. Yeah, well, that's true. I don't think we had to be, be told too much. Goes through the RFID readers at the end of pit lane so that the tyre information are relayed to uh, IMSA. No, it's K-Mag. That's K-Mag's helmet. Sorry. I, I, I second guess myself there because you're normally much better than that. Uh, than me at that with your eyes being considerably younger, less miles on your eyes. So Pagino back in the lead uh, with the fastest lap of the race as well, a new race lap record for the number 48 Cadillac. And as I say, about four more laps to go for that. Remember that off strategy caused by the pit stop required to replace the nose cone, the whole of the front of the bodywork on the 48 car after that early spin and contact when Jimmy Johnson started that car uh, in the opening stint of the race. You're listening to IMSA Radio, it's live coverage of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, presented by Advance Auto Parts, we're down 10 and a half minutes to go around the track on 99.1 FM. Further afield in the US, Sirius 216 XM 392 and around the world on RS2, the hub of IMSA Radio. Every day, every hour, every week, every month, always IMSA content on RS2 IMSA Radio via imsaradio.com. If you're in a turret that doesn't have a TV, uh, coverage for, doesn't have TV coverage for this event, then you can tune in to uninterrupted live pictures with the IMSA Radio commentary on imsaradio.com. You can click the live video tab on the top left-hand side. By the way, timing is available at imsa.com. The Alcamel system available to you there, so you can follow along as we do here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. So... That's just going to start another set of uh, pit stops. In comes Stephen Thomas for Win Autosport, the number 11 wow. Orica. Shit. My sigh of disappointment was because Stephen Thomas was catching right up to Ben Keating, and we were about to get a phenomenal battle on track, but alas, need more fuel, need new tyres. Need a driver change for Stephen Thomas. Great opening gambit for him. I believe that's the helmet of Thomas Merrill, his longtime driving coach, taking over behind the wheel, saving Tristan Nunez for a little bit later on in the race. This car, which started from pole position and was up in the top two for the entirety of its stint, fuel tires, and I would assume a drinks bottle change as well for when Thomas Merrill is behind the wheel. And what's the drive time implications then on the on the pro arm? You've talked about an hour in the pro categories. What about the pro arm like LM? P3 and GT Le Mans here. Three hour minimum for your silver and bronze drivers. Uh, with Combined or each? Each. So three hours per silver or per bronze driver in the car, meaning that you have to do your fair share of the race in order to come away with a W. And uh, the other thing that you have to keep an eye on, seven hour maximum drive time and no more than four hours driving in any six hour period. So basically what you're seeing there in a three man team, which is what we have here, your pro rated driver, your, your, your gold driver or beyond that can't do any more than half of the race is what you see. Correct. Yeah, OK, well, that makes sense. I, I, I like that. I like the way it to do these things. It uh, makes people think on the pit wall as well as behind the wheel. Zero one then. Renka van der Zander, second, uh, excuse me, uh, Kevin Magnussen got into that car at the last pit stop, didn't he? Yeah, he did. 
33 seconds uh, behind Simon Pagino, the leader now. When we were in this position last time around, it was about 26, 27 seconds, that gap. So Pagino has uh, made a little bit of a gain uh, during this stint. He'll come to pit lane shortly, although he's got two pit stops against that car on the timing screen at the moment. Remember, that first one was a splash of fuel and a uh, front bodywork change uh, on the number 48, which leads the motor race at the moment for uh, Ally Cadillac Racing and for Simon Pagano. Best of a 146.5. That is a new lap record. Uh, Ryan DL has just upped the bar a little bit in LMP2, Jeremy, the man that is known as Razzle Dazzle, Era Motorsports number 18, is the fastest car in LMP2 on, I think, his second flying lap. Yeah, and yeah, that's to be expected. I mean, it was the uh, it was the gentleman drivers, quote unquote, that, that put the start of the race. They have to qualify in the pro-am class. There has to be the uh, the gold or silver rated drivers. I basically let's say call them the AMs. That's being oversimplifying it, must admit. But uh, lesser experienced drivers, at least. Uh, so now, you know, with Ryan DL, he's one of the, the, the pros, uh, and he, uh, not surprisingly, is going a little bit quicker than the other guys. So a new fastest lap of the race. And Scott Huffaker now has just taken over from Ben Keating in the number 52 car, the youngster from Northern California. Uh, and uh, Thomas Merrill, as Chase said a little while ago, is now driving that uh, win all this one entry car number 11. So. Uh, and, and Wayne Boyd behind them, a second over from Jim McGuire in number 22 car. Those are the top five in LMP2. A yeah, great to see United Autosports here, uh, Jeremy. They've been sort of hinting, suggesting, threatening that they'd like to do a little more uh, in the States again. And it's uh, great to see uh, those now very, very well-known colours and very successfully run cars in pretty much every series around the world, whether it's in Europe or Asia uh, and here in, in the US. Great to see them here, and let's hope that's uh, the start of a, uh, of a long commitment for United Autosports. Yeah, very much so, and uh, the... Uh... The, you know, th that is, th they've sort of set up a, a base over here in the US and uh, are con you know, planning to do, or will be doing, I believe, the uh, rest of the Michelin Endurance Cup Series this year and uh, perhaps a full campaign in uh, 2022. So, uh, you know, hats off again, once again to uh, Richard Dean and uh, Zach Brown and uh, yeah, everybody else at United Order Sports. It's a, it's a big step for them, of course. Right now, with the, uh, with, the, with the global pandemic, it's not easy. Oh, yikes, that was a bit... Uh, Brave going to turn one, three cars abreast there, different classes. Um, it's, it's not easy to, 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 to make travel arrangements in this day and age as we are right now. But uh, United Air Sports certainly looking to the future here in the Interweb Tech Sports Car Championship. Uh, Jeremy was talking, Shea, the bright red number 31 of Pete Durani came into the pits after uh, another 20 lap stint possibly 21 no, it was 21 yeah indeed uh, and now we've got Simon Pagino who's come in as well and this is that stagger that we're talking about and that is a 22-0 lap stint for the 48 Ally Cadillac yeah? fuel and tires for both of the Action Express run Cadillacs, although as you said, their stagger getting a little bit closer than I'm sure they would want. But yes, Simon Pagano staying aboard the 48 and more importantly, Pippa Durrani staying aboard for a triple uh, on the Whalen Engineering Cadillac. So keeping the powder of Mike Conway and Felipe Nasser a little bit drier for now. VP Racing Field pit paddock report from Shea Adam. So who goes back to the front of the field this time? Well, it's going to be the Kanika Minolta Acura ARX05, the number 10 car with Ricky Taylor on board. Uh, is that the first time that car has led, Jeremy, uh, as it comes across the... Uh, yeah. Yes, I thought it was. It is. So that's uh, another that's lead change and another yeah, our, leader. That's right, our, our six uh, different uh, lead change. Uh, and our fourth different car that's taken out front, so he's got his way past uh, Kevin Magnussen on that last lap. I don't think we saw that, did we, on, on, our, uh, on our footage, but, uh, yeah, change of the lead, it would appear. A bit of cloud Not gathering. Yet. Sorry, go ahead, Jerry. Well, uh, they haven't yet come across the line, but so the uh, number 48 car will be still as leading lap 47, 
Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, next time around, when they do cross the line, as uh, it should be any minute now, uh, we believe it's going to be Ricky Taylor out front. 48 Cadillac already in the Jean de Bian bends. Turn 14, 15, and heading towards the back straight through Le Mans curve at 60. Taylor goes across the line as Jeremy was finishing that sentence and he has three seconds on Kevin Magnuson. So that's the gap now, Jeremy, at the front of the field. Yeah, not sure what happened. One zero, one zero, one. one. Yeah. Sure what happened there. The other interesting thing is that Lloyd Duval has closed right up on Jonathan Bomarito. Yeah. He's been in number 55 of Mansa. There was uh, that, that gap has come down by a second or so each of the last four laps since Jonathan took over the wheel of that car from Oliver Jarvis. I'm not quite sure why that would be. That was one of the cars that did manage to do 22 laps on that last stint. Uh, that and the number 01 car both did 22 lap stints. Most of the others doing 20 or perhaps 21. So that's certainly something we're going to keep an eye on as this race progresses. Now we're going to get the rest of the prototype starting to come in. And the leader in LMP2 from seventh position, Timothy Brunet for Tower Motorsports. That's the number eight, Orica, Shea Adam. That is a driver change. I believe that's Gabby Aubrey getting behind the wheel of the number eight, meaning that this car will have cycled through all three of their drivers. They were actually in the lead because the number eight made a pit stop very much out of sequence and very much earlier than it should have done. It had only been on uh, track for about eight minutes at the time, and this was well within the first hour of racing. But now they have managed to get all three drivers into the car, finishing the driver change and waiting for the seatbelts to be done. Ooh, that was a slightly slow driver change. The fuel probe unattached about two seconds before the car actually managed to get rolling. So a little bit of time lost for Tower Motorsport. But this is one of our teams that is invested in going for the Michelin Endurance Cup. They come in leading after Daytona 16 points, whereas ERA only has 13 points. So perhaps they're doing a little bit of jiggery and pokery to try and get to the lead at that eight-hour mark. If you're on IMSA.com, you can look at the onboards, of course, and one of them is... One of those uh, onboard cameras is from the 48 Cadillac, and you will notice uh, that the gun sight has disappeared because uh, the window cleaned it. Uh, not the guy who comes around with a ladder, a bucket, and a sponge, by the way. Um, the chap who's cleaning the windscreen on the 48 in the last pit stop uh, took a bit of tape with him and just slapped that down and threw a bit of tape over the top of it. Uh, thank you, Stephen Gardner, for noticing that. I had. Uh, noticed it and then forgot to mention it so thank you for reminding me of that on at uh, IMSA Radio using the hashtag RSL Sebring so Ricky Taylor leading by nearly four seconds now to Kevin Magnussen in second, Dave Cameron in third with Jonathan Bomarito in fourth respectively that is Acura Cadillac, Acura Mazda uh, the first two looking um, somewhat binary 1-0 and 0-1 in the first two positions, then the 60, then the 55, the top pick, uh, a six made up by the number five Mustang sampling Cadillac, that's the JDC Miller Motorsport car with Lloyd Duval still at the wheel, and Simon Pagino for uh, Ali, Cad Ali Cadillac. Uh, now back up into sixth position, we said it would take them a while to get there, um, and uh, they have done, but it's still the 31 uh, that is out of position. Way down the field, having dropped four laps. Shit. Uh, just hearing from the pit lane that Turner Motorsport, currently with Aiden Reed behind the wheel, they've been turning very, very good times, but they have an electrical gremlin. So that is something that will continue to rear its ugly head throughout the course of this race. Uh, electrical gremlins uh, uh, are. Uh, so unreliable. I prefer the older technology and having a clockwork gremlin, that one. Uh, at least you know when it's going to run down and stop working. Um, OK, well, that's that's bad news. Um, did we get to the bottom of what was happening with Tommy Milner's car? He's still circulating, uh, but he's still circulating uh, off the pace of the the rest of the, uh, the GT Le Mans runners. There was uh, a peer under the... Uh, back of the car to the bottom of the engine, which of course is in the middle uh, of the car now in the C8R uh, Chevy Corvette. Uh, and but he's still running. He just he, he's still not running at the pace you would expect to see. See that car ticking off the the lap shift. 
No, and, and the last that I heard from that car, which, by the way, Turner Motorsport have now come into the pit lane to try and address the electrical gremlin, so that will be a longer stop for them. Um, Tommy Milner was just going round and round, trying to make sure that the problem did not reoccur. But when they did that forced uh, restart of the system, the complete, in effect, control all delete of the car when it came in the first time, it did help out. And then they did it again on the second stop. So now things seem to be going OK. But as you said, not quite up to the pace of the front run but also Tommy Milner does not have Connor D. Felipe and Jesse Crone right behind him pushing him along like Antonio Garcia does. Share Adam of AP Racing, Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter. Jeremy Shaw is with me, John Hindoff in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre as the BMW in the Liquid Molly colours goes behind the wall. So Electrical Gremlin has escalated uh, and Shea Adam already trying to get the details. Meantime, the number 99 Porsche has had a rotation at turn number seven. That's the hard point ABM car. That's the Rob Ferriel, Earl Bamba and Trenton Este the car. And back end of that car looking very, very loose indeed. Turn 10 also with a big sideways slide. It's Rob Ferriel who's driving that. They were 11th just ahead of Christina Nielsen uh, in the sister car, literally, um, of the 88 machine. EBM is Earl Bamba Motorsport, who have teamed up with Team Hardpoint to run those GT Daytona Porsches. Still trying to make places back up, coming back up through the field. People to Rani now in 21st position working on lap number 48 leaders are on 52 so he's still three laps down that pace pretty good there or thereabouts with the leaders but really taking any time out of them he's going into turn number 17 now the leaders coming onto the back straight well actually maybe pulled out a little bit half a length of the back straight since the last pit stops Antonio Garcia by just a second now in GT Le Mans as the BMW of Conor de Filippi is back into second place. That's the red one. These two team cars have been swapping uh, places. It's going to be a long old day for 31 Cadillac and Whelan Engineering and people Durrani. Good lap last time around from Magnussen. Follows that up with a 47.5. 3.8 seconds at the head of the field. As Tristan Fortier rejoins from the pit lane, having just stopped for the that Mustang sampling number five that I was talking about. That puts the Simon Pagino Cadillac then into fifth position. And that was a, another 21 lap stint. It's time for Vortier. Shea looked like there was some work going on down in the uh, 31 Cadillac Action Express uh, pit there on a, a nose cone for that car. Or were they taking bits off it to try and uh, add back onto the 48 Cadillac that they also run? It's way easier to just swap out a nose for a nose than it is to try and reattach dive planes and whatnot. That looked to me like they were getting it ready for the next pit stop, perhaps to do another nose change. This Action Express grouping as a whole, that will be their fourth nose cone of the weekend between the two different cars. So, yes, they're uh, quite adept at doing the nose changes at this point in time. But I was just distracted by a note that came up on the timing screen, John. We saw that moment for Rob Ferriel. Uh, incident involving cars 24 and 99, meaning that he might have gotten a little bit of help from Jesse Krohn. Okay. It is currently under review. Right. Thank you, Sheik. Good spot there. A bit of a battle brewing up at the front of LMP2 at the moment. Uh, Jeremy, the Win Autosport car, that's the uh, number 11 uh, machine, uh, is closing down on the leader. We've got... Uh, who do we put in that? We put Thomas Murrell in that, and he's chasing down Scott Huffaker for PR1 Matheson Motorsport in the 52. That's right, the two uh, Northern California drivers, uh, Scott Huffaker from the San Francisco area, Thomas Merrill, who lives just down the road from Wales Tech Raceway in Laguna Seca in Salinas, and uh, they are uh, having a good little battle there in these two cars. Great to see both these two guys having the opportunity. Thomas Merrill 
Uh, he, he, his first uh, proper racing was in the uh, Pacific uh, F2000 Championship 10, 15 years ago now. And uh, he was a bit of a star in that, but he was never able to, to get the funding together to get a proper career going. The last few years, however, he's all, the, all, the, all the time he's been coaching drivers and had, had, had a really good career at that. The last couple of years, he's had an opportunity to drive in the Trans Am Series, done really, really well there. And now, uh, yeah, coming on board here with uh, Stephen Thomas to help out uh, Ross Bentley with the driving coach duties. Uh, and uh, Stephen has put him in this car and he's uh, absolutely loving it. And it's super to see someone like Thomas Merrill getting this opportunity uh, at, uh, at this stage. He's been around this world, as I say, for a little while now, but uh, he's, uh, he's now 34 years of age and just really relishing this opportunity. But Scott Huffaker, uh, a, a much younger driver, he's, uh, he's, he's still only... Uh, how old is he? 20, 20 or 21, and uh, yeah, he's uh, still got. He's got a big future in, in this sport ahead of him, no question about it. Uh, he's a former winner of the Team USA scholarship, of course. But again, he doesn't. He, Huffaker name is very, very well known in California, uh, mainly through minis back in the old days. Uh, but uh, he's not a member of that particular family. But, uh, but Scott Huffaker has a, a big future ahead of him. And as we say that, he's just come across the line to set a new fastest lap of the race in LMP2. That's Scott Huffaker in the number 52 car for the also California-based PR1 Matheson Motorsports team. And that is a new lap record there as well uh, in race trim uh, for Scott Huffaker in LMP2, I believe, a 49. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. big incident down uh, at turn seven. Now, was that what happened early on? No, that is the right car. It's happened a couple of seconds ago. Uh, no, sorry, it is a replay of the... See, Heinoff looks away to check notes and we get a replay. So I still didn't see the coming together there that caused that, but Shea Adam, it has caused a penalty. It has, and the penalty has already been served by Jesse Krohn in the 24 BMW, currently on the outlap. This is going to drop him back off the tail of that battle for the lead between Antonio Garcia and Connor Felipe, separated by a second at the front of the field right now. But yes, the incident responsibility going the way of the BMW driver. Um, update on another BMW, by the way. We've got Turner back in the garage area. They are currently working to either change the alternator or the alternator belt, not the crotch belt. We're not assigning blame to you, my friend, on Twitter. Um, but they are working at it at the hauler. This leads me to be a bit concerned, though, because they said electrical gremlin. So if there is an issue with something perhaps draining the battery, if it is the alternator, changing it might not be the end of the day for them. It might be a continuing problem yet. Yeah, if you, electrical gremlins, we thought, but if the alternator isn't being driven properly or isn't putting out the right voltage, all of these uh, cars nowadays uh, yeah. like to have... Um, well, all their ECUs like to have a fairly stable power supply, Jeremy, and, and that that could be the yeah. start of a very long day indeed. Yeah, what we see on screen now is really interesting. Though. First of all, we see the battle for the lead in LMP2 with Scott Huffaker. Who, by the way, the old lap record holder was Gustavo Menezes, so uh, hats off there to Huffaker. But right behind those two uh, is the overall leader, Ricky Taylor. Well, actually, right behind him is, is not uh, Ricky Taylor. It's actually Tristan Boccia, who's trying to stay on the lead lap ahead of the overall leader, Ricky Taylor. So uh, that has a big I don't think he's had quite made the pass. So. Uh, so Voce now in great danger of going a lap down in the five car and he's kind of defending the inside position there as they head down the back straight into turn 10 side by side it's not for position but it is to stay on the lead lap for Tristan Voce in car number five use the number 12 Lexus as a bit of a pick there and used it very nicely indeed in uh, turn 10 they come through 13 now I think that was uh, was that Carl Kirkwood uh, that was in that that uh, Lexus through the Jean de Bian? GTD leader. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, GTD leader. So you've got the two class leaders there, and somebody desperately trying to stay on the overall lead lap. And Vaudier will know what he clearly knows what's going on here. Remember, there was a little bit of damage on the left front uh, of that car. I think that's, that nose cone's being swapped out now as they, they get the draft down the back straight and the overall leader goes to the far right-hand side, gets position to go through into turn 17, but there's all sorts going on 
right ahead and the black and blue Ricky Taylor driven Konica Minolta Acura is through and that means that Tristan Fortier in the Mustang sampling JDC Miller Motorsports a Cadillac that is the number five car going across the line and in turn one now is now off the lead lap that isn't over yet because there's all kinds of cars that they've got to go through and past including a couple of GT Le Mans runners That's the battle for first and second at GT Le Mans, actually, that they're coming up to uh, now. Now, uh, is that a new, another new fastest lap for Ryan DL? Yes, another new fastest lap in LMP2, another new lap record in LMP2. We are really seeing some good times here early on, Jeremy. The track must be in decent uh, condition. The weather is about perfect, 21, 22 degrees uh, Celsius. That's sitting around about 70 Fahrenheit on both the air in, in both the air and on the, the track and the, the pro drivers getting down to work with still a little over 10 hours to go we'll get back to Jeremy and Shane in just a moment we've gone through to another hour on the clock midday at Sebring high noon and it sees Ricky Taylor leading by 1.7 seconds in the number 10 Conrad Minolta Acura from Magnussen in second in the 0-1 Cadillac from Chip Ganassi Racing. He's got 15 seconds over third, which is Dean Cameron in the 60 Acura. In LMP2, Scott Huffaker is leading for the PR1 Matheson Motorsport Orica. He's got uh, about a second and a half of the win Autosport uh, Orica and Era in third position with a hard charging and now lap record holding for LMP2. Ryan DL in the number 18 era car. In GT Le Mans, starting to get interesting there too at the front of the field. 12th and 13th overall, first and second in class for Corvette Racing's uh, Tonio Garcia as Conor de Felipe pulls into the pits for the second place BMW, the red number 25. His teammate has just pitted and rejoined. Uh, that is the darker colour car, Gustav Farfus behind the wheel of the 24 car. In LMP3, it's Rasmus Lind for Performance Tech, 14th position overall in the number 38 Ligier, who leads from 47 Motorsports to Kane D08. That's the number 7 car. Oliver Askew uh, behind the wheel there, and Dylan Murray for Riley Motorsports is in third in the number 91. And last but by no means least, the GT. Daytona category is, he is led by Kyle Kirkwood for Vassar Sullivan's Lexus number 14 with Trent Hinman only half a second behind for Wright Motorsports Porsche uh, and in third pl place it's Brian Sellers another four and a half seconds further back in the number one but there is damage to the number 99 that is the Porsche we were talking about earlier on one of the half point EBM cars and it's rubbing on the front uh, left front wheel so contact earlier on, being off the road as well. I think it may have clipped the, one of the advertising hoardings. But that is your update then at just afternoon in the 69th annual Mobile One. 12 hours of Sebring presented by Advanced Auto Parts. Team Hardpoint EBM Porsche number 99 comes into the pits after more contact. Shea Adam. That is EB getting aboard of that car as well. Earl Bamber, a lot of damage to the nose. Uh, Rob Ferriel had a pretty decent size off at turn five. Managed to get the car pointing in the right direction and back out and running once again. But that car will be in the pit lane for a significant amount of time as they are going to work on it. They're getting the blocks to be able to put the car up on the air jacks and actually have mechanics underneath the car. That tells me that there is a lot more work to be done to that car than meets the eye. But they have to finish refueling before they can put the hood back down and then get to work properly. So Team Hardpoint right now are uh, dealing with that issue. Meanwhile, their sister car, Christina Nielsen, still out on track, still pounding around. And we are due GTD pit stops here shortly. That should mean that the 88th pit stop is going to be a lot more congested with the sister car in the box at the same time. And before we get to those GT Daytona pit stops, Jeremy Shaw uh, will be smiling very widely indeed. Kirkwood 
Hinman and Sellers. First, second and third at the moment in GTD. And they all have one thing in common, Jeremy. Yeah, they do. They're all Team USA scholarship winners, which is kind of cool, isn't it? I must admit. And uh, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, Team USA scholarship winners in this race. Actually, I haven't counted out how many, but uh, another one is running in third position in uh, overall. That's Dane Cameron. And, uh, yeah, cool to see uh, Kirkwood, Hinman and Sellers. Yeah, they're all in kind of different stages of their careers, perhaps, but uh, they're all youngsters. They all were youngsters who went to, uh, well, two of them... Uh, most of them in England to race, to race in Formula Ford cars. Brian Sellers actually went to New Zealand along with AJ Allmanoga back in 2001, I guess it was, and uh, had a lot of uh, lot of fun down there. They ended up actually uh, being in contention for the New Zealand Formula Ford Championship, which was kind of cool. So, yeah, it was a long time ago, it seems, now for Brian Sellers. God, hard to believe it was 20 years ago. Good gracious. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, he's going to love that you've just told everybody that. Uh, as well, it's worse for me, trust me. <laughs> How many years of Team USA now, uh, Jeremy? It was 1990, the first one. So, you know, 31 years, but the 32nd choice of winners will be uh, hopefully selected this year. Well, keep us up to date with that because it's always something we enjoy following here on uh, IMSA Radio. By the way, Conor De Filippi did come into the pits a few moments ago, uh, a lap after his BMW Team RLL teammate, and there was a driver change there. Conor finally being hauled out of the car shed. Connor, another one of Jeremy's Team USA boys, uh, who actually had dinner with you and Eve not too very long ago in the grand scheme of things. We've met, uh, we've yes, met was... most of them down through the years, certainly in the last decade or so, I would say. Yeah, fuel and tires for the, the BMW Bruno Spangler put aboard that car. Rasmus Lind is in the pit lane for performance tech out of the lead of LMP3 one more time. I would imagine that that will be a driver change as Rasmus has been in since the beginning. He's got two choices to uh, hand over to, either Matteo Urena or Dean Goldberg making his debut, not only in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, but at the Sebring 12 Hours as well. So that's an exciting option there for performance tech. Uh, and who else did I see came into the pit lane? Oh, nobody that time by. But we do have a lot of cars up and down the field, particularly in the GT area, where their first number is a five. And that typically means they owe me a visit. Thank you, Shep, for that update from our VP Racing Field, Pit Paddock Report. So who's due in next at the front of the field? Let me consult the uh, lap charts. Remembering, of course, that the last one in uh, will be the 50... Actually, uh, Vautier is the last one. Now, he's only completed eight laps of the stint. Uh, Ricky Taylor in in the next couple, Dean Cameron in in the next couple, Kevin Magnussen in in the next couple. So all of those top four will be in. Uh, and then it will be the Simon Passion or Driven Car for about uh, five or six laps leading. Tristan Fort, you remember, off the lead lap now. And the first car off the lead lap and one of only two DPIs, of course, the problem earlier on with the right-hand side suspension for people to run, it cost them four laps in the number 31 Cadillac. I'm very impressed, Jeremy, at the overall pace we're seeing here. Um, what is the lap distance record? at the 12 hours of Sebring. It's the magic number. I know you will have it there somewhere. Yeah, 348 laps, in fact, which, is, which curiously has been achieved on three occasions in DPI. In 2017, so it was equaled in 2019 and last year as well. Mark. As it stands right now, we're well ahead of that, as you might uh, expect, given all of the green flag running that we've had and we've only had indeed one uh, intervention by the very lovely Corvette from the safety car point of view and as much as we love that C8R uh, leading the 
was looking at it leading the field around. We really hope we don't see too much more of it. So at the moment, we're well ahead of that game. I'll keep an eye on that. I've written down 348 on my important piece of paper. Class leaders then, Cunningham and Alter, Acura number 10, LMP2, PR1 Matheson Motorsport, Tony Garcia in the pitch here, leading GT Le Mans. Fuel, tyres and potentially a driver change as I did see another helmeted driver up on the wall. There was no driver change for WeatherTech Racing when they brought the Porsche in. Jam Jam stays aboard. The number 79 in the red, white and blue. And we have had a couple of GTD stops just now. We've got Corey Lewis aboard the number one Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. Also into the pit lane, the 75 Sun Energy One Mercedes. Mikkel Grenier brought that car into the pit lane, waiting to see who takes it back out. Uh, Christina Nielsen is out of the number eight after doing her opening gambit. And Bia Figuero is into the Porsche. And happy belated birthday to Bia. She just celebrated the other day. And that has actually triggered a slew of other people to come in. We've got Michael De Casada in the number 28 Allegra Mercedes also down the lane, the number 83. LMP3 machine, Rodrigo Salas driving the Win Auto Sport car. Since the beginning of the race, I would imagine he'll be getting out of that car at this point. And it was indeed Jordan Taylor taking over the number three Corvette. VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock Report takes us to 10 hours to go. Two hours of racing having been completed. Uh, a number of additions I've noticed uh, down towards turn one. A couple of scissor lifts there. In fact, two or three of them, three or four of them, uh, which appear to have some spotters uh, on them there, rather than on the old uh, metal grandstand or bleacher, really, that used to be on the entrance, Jeremy, to, to turn 17 on drivers' right. But uh, there's clearly some uh, spotting going on from up there. Across the line, the Lexus... That is leading GT Daytona into turn number one. And just uh, putting a lap on one of its competitors there. Trent Hinman, only half a second behind the NSX that it's just gone by. And uh, that is the Magnus with Archangel John Potter, number 44 car. And it's uh, just lost a lap to its class leader. Speed racer livery from Daytona, partially carrying over. Notice on the side uh, of that car. Uh, Nicky, uh, Nicky, Ricky Taylor is in the pit lane, and that is spot on time. That is at the end of his 20th lap. And Shea Adam is watching the pit stop for the Conic in Minolta Cadillac. Fuel tires and out, 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 Ricky. It's Philippe Albuquerque's time to play in the Acura around Sebring International Raceway. So they are doing the driver change very calm, no urgency whatsoever. Philippe actually walked around the side of the car as if he was going for a walk with his wife and kids. Uh, that was very calm, cool, and collected. Fueling is the last thing they're waiting on. The tire change is done. The door closes for the driver change. The car comes off the air jacks and just waiting for every last drop of that VP racing fuel to get in the tank. Away goes Philippe. So everybody, stand back from the fence. It's just a little bit. Philippe Albuquerque is scary fast around Sebring. And Shea, uh, we, we had the the team hardpoint car in for some uh, remedial work on that damage. Uh, did we mention how long that took? I'm pretty sure they lost four laps doing that work. Earl Bamber is now out on the racetrack. But what's concerning me is that the Sun Energy One Mercedes came into the pit lane with Mikhail Granier behind the wheel exactly on time as it should have been. It's still in the pit lane, so I need to figure out what's going on with that car. They've been running super well. And remember, they have Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona winner, Mauro Angle aboard. So by dint of that, he's points leader in the championship. They are second in the championship, having finished second for Sun Energy One. And then in terms of the Michelin Endurance Cup points, well, it was looking pretty good for Mauro Angle too. This is going to take him right out of it. Yeah, I haven't seen that car in the pit lane but I don't think it's gone behind the wall yet that's the 75 AMG Mercedes we are talking about it had moved up 
from 11th to well inside the top 10. I think he was running as high as 7th uh, at one stage. But clearly some issues yeah. there, Jeremy. Yeah, that's disappointing for them. Of course, Mario Engel, because uh, he has switched teams, he is driving with this team, having driven for the Windward Racing Team, the opening race at uh, Daytona. He comes into this race day, not the weekend, uh, as the championship leader, because, of course, uh, that car qualified fourth. There are now qualifying points available in the Innsworth Tech Sports Car Championship new for this season. So he was the clear championship leader by 28 points over his co-drivers from Daytona, Russell Ward, Phil Ellis, and Indy Dodge, Windward Racing, of course, not here this weekend. Yeah, that was a, uh, a toe in the water. Um, and, and they pretty much dived yeah. in and got soaking wet and took home a whole load of uh, Rolex Daytona Cosmographs with them. And their stock in trade, if you will, is the Michelin Pilot Challenge, which was yesterday. Uh, front of the field, we've been predicting it, and in they come, Kevin Magnussen, uh, already in and out shape. Yes, indeed, fuel tires and a nice clean of the windshield for Kevin Magnuson. So now he's back out around the, the uh, circuit. And we've had a couple other notable driver changes in this last couple of moments. Um, Oliver Askew not yet out of the number seven for 47 in the LMP3 category. Remember, this is the car that started from the pit lane. They are out there. They are pounding around. And they were in second before the pit stop. So just wanted to mention that. But Patrick Long is now aboard the number 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche. All all three of their drivers have shared in that vehicle. And who's the other one I saw? Oh, Lexus's. Lexus have done pit stops. GTV leader is in the pit lane right now, Kyle Kirkwood. Fuel and tires for that car. I don't think they're going to put Jack in quite yet, but they did take Aaron Tielitz out and put Kyle Kirkwood in in the first stop. So if they're going to cycle through all three of their drivers, that would be now. The other Lexus leaves in Robbie McGinnis for another stint, though, behind the wheel of the number 12 machine. So they have not yet cycled through all three of their drivers yet either. Ooh, in the pit, Simon Pagenaud. Uh, now that feels early to me, Jeremy, by a good couple of yeah. laps. Yeah, by uh, three or four laps, absolutely right. Uh, he just uh, retaken the lead of the, uh, the of the race, the uh, sixth lead change uh, uh, in this race so far. And yeah, that's certainly a surprise. I would expect him to stay out another four or five laps, or three or four laps anyhow, before uh, bringing that car onto pit lane. But uh, he had been running directly behind number 55, so I thought that should have been enabled him to save a little bit of fuel. Um, interesting that he should come in a little bit earlier than we had anticipated. And meanwhile, another change for the lead in LFP2. Thomas Merrill has found his way past the Hoffaker, so now the, it's the widow of the sport entry, kind of 11 at the lead in LFP2. Uh, what I could work out there, Shea, is whether the ally Cadillac number 48 has actually got to its pit. Uh, all the way down to its pit. Oh, yes, it has. It's rolling again, and it's come straight back out. So uh, not a very long pit stop, but as uh, Jeremy said, at least three, possibly more laps uh, earlier than we might have expected. Any news from the team yet? Uh, nothing from the team yet as to why the stop was so early. I did just get confirmation, though, from Turner Motorsport. They are back out on the racetrack from behind the wall of the garage. It was an alternator. They've changed it. They are now, well, seven laps behind the next down car, which is the Earl Bamber car number 99, which in itself is to one lap behind the 75 of Nicole Grenier, still working to find out what happened to the Sun Energy One Mercedes, which lost two laps on that pit stop. So a lot going on right now. Yeah, it's a shame. As uh, Jeremy said, they were running very nicely in day. Pagenaud has stayed aboard the Cadillac, uh, the number 48 car. And it sounds reasonable enough from the onboard microphone. But, uh, well, keep an eye. It's its fourth pit stop, remember. It had to do want to change the nose early on. But it's uh, rather lost that little advantage that it was getting. And it had been pulling out a wee bit with uh, Simon Pagenaud at the wheel see where it comes round when it comes round, should be coming across the line shortly, just coming into turn 17 now, Albuquerque has gone through in the 1-0 Cadillac, uh, the 1-0 Acura, excuse me, and the 0-1 Cadillac
Cadillac is Kevin Magnussen. Cameron's gone through for Acura. And Pagino goes through in fourth position then, ahead of the Mazda by about seven seconds. It's not all bad, but uh, just a query on that one. Jeremy will be keeping an eye on that to make sure if we find out what's happened and to make sure that they're not going to only be doing 18 lap stints from now on, that would be a disadvantage. It would say, yeah, because the, the, the Mazda once again did 22 laps mm. on that stint for uh, Jonathan Bomarito. Uh, most of that's, I think that's the only one who did uh, more than 21 laps on that last stint, actually. Uh, all the other contenders did uh, 21, but as you say, only 18 for that number 48 car. Curious. Yeah. Again, you know, it could be something simple as um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it on the tyres or something like that. And that could be the issue. 52 wins LMP2 car in the pit lane for full service. And driver change, also the win Autosport blue and yellow LMP2 in the pit lane as well, so that is first and second in LMP2 in the pit lane and going out as they came in, as people Durrani pulls into the pits, I'm pausing just for a second win Autosport out first yes Driver steering aboard. Uh, ben Keating in the 52. So that was a driver change. It was Scott Huffaker, I think, who brought it in. People Durrani getting out of the red and white wheel and Cadillac. Yeah, well, he doesn't share either. <laughs> People doesn't share Cadillacs. Um, Joy doesn't share food. People doesn't share Cadillacs. Uh, he had done 20 laps as well on that stint. 21. 21, excuse 21. me, because he hasn't quite, uh, yeah, hasn't tripped the line. Excellent. And yeah. heads Each back out. Each pit stop's been uh, 21. So, which, which makes that 48 Ally Cadillac even, uh, even more odd, because the other Cadillacs haven't had any issues in that respect, Jeremy. So we, we will have to try and, A, try and find out or B, keep an eye on both of those, uh, actually, as to what's going on. It's still jo it's, it's still Corvette number three now, Jordan Taylor leading in GT Le Mans, Dan Goldberg for Performance Tech uh, leads LMP3 on the pit stop cycle, and Kyle Kirkwood is behind the wheel of the number 14, uh, Vassar Sullivan. Uh, that is the Lexus number 14, isn't it, that leads GT Daytona, and Philippe Albuquerque now behind the wheel of the overall leader and leader in DPI by about 16 and a half seconds here. Uh, Albuquerque doing a cracking job. Kevin Magnussen racing as uh, one of two, Jeremy, um, one of a couple, actually, of, of very experienced rookies uh, in IMSA and at Sebring, therefore, uh, this year. Kevin coming in from Formula One, really announced himself uh, pretty impressively at the Rolex 24 Daytona and he's taking to this sports car racing thing rather well. Yeah, absolutely loving it. You know, he's, uh, he was very grateful for the time he spent in Formula One. Uh, this is a co completely different of course and uh, enjoyable in a different way, but he certainly loves the atmosphere that there is in the IMSA World Tech Sports Car Championship. You know, there's a lot more camaraderie uh, than there is in Formula One. Well, there isn't any camaraderie in Formula One, basically, so even amongst your, <laughs> your own team. Uh, but that could be the here. worst, actually, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, he's bloody, he just, he, you know, he, he's, he's thrilled to fact he's, he's got a really, really competitive car now, which he hasn't had, of course, in Formula One uh, since, uh, since he's been there. Well, most of the time he's been there. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's now, he knows he can challenge for wins, it's a completely new discipline for him to learn, but of course, he has a big advantage there in that his dad is a guy called, called Jan Magnussen, who has a huge amount of success in this series. Jan had, had uh, brought Kevin to uh, quite a few of the races back through the years uh, when he was much younger. 
So, Kevin, you know, he knows how it works over here. He's been to most of the tracks, even, though, even if he hasn't been on them in a racing car. Uh, and uh, he's using that, that experience and all of his dad's prior experience to get himself right up to, to, uh, to speed with, uh, you know, with a minimum of, uh, of delay. It was Felipe Nasser who took over from Pipo Durrani, or Peter Durrani, as I called him earlier on. So we've got two new drivers here, uh, even from what we were expecting, because we've uh, got Nicky Taylor and Peter Durrani. I've already uh, coined those this week. This has been noticed on the Radio Show Limited Listeners Collective. Hello to everybody over there on Facebook. If you want to get us here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre at IMSA Radio, hashtag RSL Sebring. And a reminder, at 1 o'clock on Tuesday Eastern Time, it's 5 o'clock in the UK, another hour of Haggerty, Haggerty Inside Track and the responsible adult working hard to get some more quality guests for another hour of chat from the headline makers from this race at Sebring. The Haggerty community pages, we'll make sure that we post all the links, ask your questions and get involved there from 1 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, Eastern Time. That's Haggerty Inside Track. Looking forward to that again. So Jordan Taylor now having pulled out nine seconds uh, on the chasing BMW of Bruno Spengler. The red car back into second place now. That was just a second and a half, not so very long ago. Remember, the 24 car had to do a drive-through for incident responsibility. By the way, if you're just talking about Kevin Magnussen there, if you're uh, in Denmark, you might not know this if you're listening on uh, RS1, but the race is being covered in Danish by your same broadcaster who looks after your F1, and it's Jens Henson along with John Nielsen and Michael Christensen, I think, is uh, helping out as well this weekend. I know Jens won't be listening because he's too busy talking. Uh, and describing the race. But, uh, best of luck to them for their show. Not often I say go and tune away, but if uh, that is your language, those guys doing a cracking job for the Danish broadcaster. Trying to get a few more races for Jens and John to look after as well through the season and where they don't clash with Formula One. It's possible that that might happen. We'll give you more news of that for those of you in that part of Scandinavia. And with the movement of Le Mans, of course, to uh, August, it does mean that there's no clash now with uh, the Le Mans and the um, Canadian Grand Prix. Uh, presuming that goes ahead, but uh, at the moment, Le Mans on a free weekend for the insurance fans in Denmark, of which I know there are many. The k Riser campsite is not too far away from uh, our broadcast position. Uh, Shit, Adam, uh, time for a update from the, our pit and paddock, the VP Racing Field pit and paddock reporter. Who do you have? Hopefully we have Renger Vandezanda. Renger, heck of an opening stint out there. You wanted the lead of the race from the green flag and you got it. How is that 0-1 Cadillac handling? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, I mean, the car is just uh, rolling uh, really nicely. Um, we, uh, we, I was just having a really nice chill out, two stand run out there, and um, you know, it was nice to bring it into the lead and uh, and give it to Kevin. And we're, uh, we're we're having a good time. I was it was a bit rough out there with the 31. I don't know what he was trying to do. Where that wall has been there for 40 years by now, so uh, you know it's gonna squeeze on you. But um, it's it's okay, and uh, the car wasn't damaged at that point. We're still battling away, and uh, it's such a long way to go. So uh, no 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 risk. Um, keep going, and uh, the car feels good. I'm I'm a happy place here. You said you're chilling out there, but everybody keeps resetting the fastest lap times. I mean, we're, we're seeing the race lap record broken time after time. Does it really feel chill behind the wheel? Because it looks frantic on TV. Yeah, no, it's never chill in Sebring, is it? With all those bumps, and it's, it's a tough track, and it always gets hot, so uh, it's never really chilled out. But um, 
you know, where um, um, this track has so much evolution, you know, even when you go testing here, sometimes from the morning to the afternoon, you can have three seconds of a difference. So sometimes the time will tumble and uh, become quicker, and sometimes you will lose a lot of lap time and the car feels horrible. So uh, I think I think every time it cools down, it's going to be good. The time's going to be faster. So uh, probably the track temperature just dropped a little, and we, uh, we're we all speeding up. So, uh, but so far, so good. And, um, you know, uh, Scott has, still has to do his thing before I get into it again. But uh, I can't wait to, uh, to get myself back into the race. How much of a help is it? I, I know this weekend you've got uh, your other half with you and your kids in the RV. How much of a help is it, particularly at a racetrack like Sebring, to be able to step away from the race and spend some time with them? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's uh, it's fantastic. And, um, you know, with, with the COVID stuff, it's, uh, it's not easy to uh, to bring them along. And uh, it was quite a while in, in the U.S. right now, so we're... Uh, we're having this RV where we can pull back, uh, actually getting a bit of a, a massage going after the first few stints. Give me, give me uh, gummy beer style and then, uh, um, you know, just a bit, have a bit of uh, lunch and then go back into the car. So it's, uh, that's pretty, uh, it, it's awesome to have them here. It's, it's really, uh, really special. Hey, Rango, tied off in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Center here, cracking opening uh, to this race. You guys have a double stint at your, your Michelin tyres, yeah, but you will have been looking at them with your Michelin tyre engineers. Um, what, what situation are they when they're coming off the cars? I mean, uh, they, they are made for it to, to do with the double stint. Um, to be honest, I don't think we need to do a double stint because we are... Uh, we are okay. We saved enough time in, uh, in practice to uh, to not be double stinting now in the race. And uh, at the end of my stint, I, I could still do the fastest lap. And it's always a combination of how much fuel is ran out of the car uh, during the stint and how much the tires are still alive. But uh, uh, for sure, double stinting won't be an issue. It's not as hard as it normally is here in uh, uh, I can tell you. So that helps a lot. But uh, the tires are holding on very nicely. Well, your car in and out of the pit lane and. Uh... Uh, heading back out onto the circuit. Uh, we'll let you... Uh, sorry, no, that's uh, the Mustang sampling car. Uh, I'll, I'll hand you back to Shea for another quick question before we get back to the action. Yeah, awesome. How hard is it for you to be able to disconnect? Uh, with the, with the, uh, from the race, you mean? I mean, to be honest, uh, right yeah. now I'm watching you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing you guys talk and, uh, about the race, and it gives me a lot of insight about all what happened, you know? So, so sometimes when you're in the car, you're you're not getting along. You're not getting all the information that, uh, that is about the race. And, uh, you know, uh, also always checking my buddies, uh, like, you know, Blake Kamalo or uh, some other Dutchies or people that, uh, that I, I like on track to see how they're doing and then, um, you know, like you say, the family is here, just having a chill out um, um, with, uh, with, with the big one. The small one is killing the big one right now, actually, but uh, that's, that's, that's just the excitement of the day, so it's fun. It's, uh, it's fun, and like you say, it's nice to disconnect a little bit for, uh, for, uh, for an hour or two before going back into the car. Ranger, thank you so much for chatting with us. Good Cheers, luck, and we'll keep trying to bring you some insight. Awesome, yeah. Keep keep talking, give us all the insights because I'm uh, I'm catching up on it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> have to find more secrets for Renger now. Yeah, we will. Uh, BP Racing Field Pit Paddock Report with Renger van der Zander. Thanks to him for joining us live from his chill-out zone at, uh, at Sebring International Raceway. Thanks to our technical team in London for making uh, all of the technical bits and pieces work. The car that came in and out as I was glancing around was the Mustang sampling car, uh, not Rengas. Uh, Tristan Portier is staying in that car. It's coming to the end of its outlap now. Yeah, as expected, uh, Luke Duval started out that car. He did, in effect, a double stint. It appears as a triple stint because of an additional trip back down the pit lane. But Tristan Botia expected to stay in for a triple, this beginning his second stint in that number five Mustang sampling Cadillac. Uh, we did have another caller that I saw, uh, LMP2. Who was it? It was somebody in LMP2. Um, I believe maybe Ben Keating. No, Tim, Timothy Barrett is back aboard the number eight of uh, Star Works, Tower Motorsport with Star Works, as he and John Ferrano are the only two drivers who have shared that car so far. I thought I saw Gabby Aubrey getting in, but he has yet to drive. Thanks, Shep. 
Shea Adam, BP Racing Field Pit Paddock reporter Jeremy Shaw uh, with me, John Hindhoff in the Hackney Global Broadcast Centre. Albert Kirk just gently being pulled back by Kevin Magnussen here. A couple of tenths that lap, a couple of tenths the, the lap before Jeremy coming down to under 11 seconds now. That gap at the front of the field. Then eight, nearly nine seconds back to Dan Cameron in third for the MSR Acura. And about the same back again to the Ally, uh, Ally Cadillac of uh, still Simon Paginot. So the top four within 30 seconds here. So still very, very much all to play for in these opening hours. Yeah, that's right, John. And really, there's been very little change uh, in the relative uh, gaps between the top uh, five cars that remain on the lead lap. With that pit stop, the five car falls back off the lead lap again. So uh, Tristan Bautier is uh, certainly got some work to do there with that with that uh, team. He, he lost that lap during the previous stint. He gained it back briefly when the other guys pitted before he had to make his own pit stop. Again, uh, that number five car turning uh, 21 lap stints as pretty much all the Cadillacs seem to be doing. It's only number 55 Mazda was able to run a little bit longer and that's now in fifth position and uh, 45, almost 45 seconds behind the lead but uh, as we talked about all the way along just keeping that car in contention you really need to do at this stage in the race. In LMP2, Thomas Merrill leads now for the uh, 11 car with Auto Sport. Uh, the number 52 car about half a dozen laps ago did make, well, they both made a pit stop. Merrill stayed aboard number 11 and number 52 Two, Scott Hufflinger and back to Ben Keating uh, and Ben Keating now is in running in the third position and behind Ryan DL and it's Jim McGuire back at the wheel of number 22 car having taken over from uh, Wayne Boyd just a little while ago so uh, Jim McGuire looking to uh, to get more of his stint completed before he will hand over the, the number 22 car uh, to uh, Wayne Boyd and Guy Smith of course making his return after a lengthy absence to the WeatherTech Sports Car Champion. Actually, he's never driven, actually, a WeatherTech race, Guy Smith. Uh, so in the, the sort of modern era of IMSA, he's making his debut. Yeah, you're right, actually. That's a good point. You, we, we think of him down through the years in a number of machines, obviously, uh, most famously with, with Dyson in, in prototypes, but, but not in the, the new era of IMSA. Very good point, Jeremy. Does that, does that count him as a rookie again, then? He's a, he's a WeatherTech sports car rookie. No, it's a yeah. shit. Yeah, does he have to carry stripes on the car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got to carry an extra set of mats in the car as a rookie. Uh, that's what happens. Um, Said nobody ever. <laughs> Still, the, the cup phone holder thing, the phone holder that goes into your... Uh, the cup holder from WeatherTech is still the cleverest, simplest and cleverest thing I have ever seen for a car. That is that is absolutely or a truck. Brilliant. It's called Cup Ford. F O N E. It's brilliant. So you'll find that on the WeatherTech oh, site. I, I don't have one because we can't get them in the UK, Jeremy. And of course, um, it's rather difficult for me to uh, to get to the States <laughs> and bring anything back. To you. Get one of those, right. It's a brilliant, point. simple idea. It really is. Well, yeah, there, there was uh, the, the gap guard uh, was another good, uh, good invention. It was uh, invented by another uh, another uh, racer. Escapes me. Maybe we'll come back to that. I'm sure. But that was a, that was a sort of a, a bit of uh, of uh, polystyrene or foam that sits fits between the centre console and the seat side. Because how many times have you lost something? down between the seat and, and the centre console, uh, the, the, the uh, central tunnel of the, ca of the uh, car, the prop shaft can not tell you if it's it a rear-wheel drive car, uh, or if it isn't, it, it, it goes much further down as well, doesn't it? It's really difficult to find the darn thing. So, yeah, and it's normally, down, and and it's normally something that you need at that exact moment, so you try and pull your wallet out of your pocket and it falls down there because you need your credit card to pay a toll or, or fill the car up with petrol, or you drop your phone down there when it's ringing and it you had Bluetooth, it, or you've got an old car like me that doesn't have uh, Bluetooth, and you pulled up to take the phone call, and the first thing you do is drop it down the side of the seat. You can't get, get your hands around it. Yeah, I like that. Make a cup phone is what I'm talking about. Go check it out at the WeatherTech uh, WeatherTech site. It is the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, second round of the 2021 championship. 
So far, so good for our calendar with the Rolex 24th Daytona running at when it was meant to. This is the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring presented by Advanced Auto Parts on its correct weekend. Also the second round of the Michelin Endurance Cup with still, what, about 90 minutes before we start handing out points for that. Cheer will keep us in the loop. Just keep, keep an eye open for people going slightly different on their strategy, those who are concentrating uh, on that. It's one of our Porsche keys to the race. Great battle in LMP2. Really enjoying watching that at the moment. And got to say, Jeremy, tip of the hat to IMSA. Asked their competitors what they could do uh, in times that were significantly better than we've had in the last 14 months. What they could do to increase LMP2, what would bring more people in. The teams fed the information back, IMSA did it, and even given the ridiculous situation that we find ourselves in globally now, with travel, etc., uh, and how difficult that is, uh, we have got uh, five cracking entries here, and we saw at Daytona as well a pretty decent battle in LMP2, and long may that continue here. And IMSA, I like seeing the LMP2 cars here. Yeah, they are, I do too. They're, they are great, and it's, it's certainly good to see them uh, having a good little battle there at the front, and a you know, long, long way to go. And it's, you know, the, 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 the gap between the cars are going to change a lot more in that category than they do, for example, in DPI, because it is a pro-am class, so you have to have uh, bronze and silver rated drivers at the wheel of those cars, and uh, by definition, they're not as quick as the, uh, as, as the golds or the platinums, because uh, they, they are the more experienced drivers. We've got a new fastest lap, ergo, uh, a new lap record, by the way, last time round for Kevin Magnussen, 146.297 then for uh, for the for the Danish driver that's a full second quicker than the old black record which was 474 remarkable speed we're seeing by all of these cars in fact uh, all of the prototypes have gone faster than the old black record during this race really yeah. wow so what's changed then jeremy is is it just the temperature is it just that the track is in a, a better p position is it that michelin have learned and the teams have learned more about the Michelin tyres. What is it? Yeah, no, I mean, conditions are great right now. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's rare that we come to see me and see such perfect track conditions, uh, I think. And then that's what it boils down to. You know, the weather is just conducive to good lap times. And uh, there's been very few people oh. off the track. <laughs> Say that. Jeremy, <laughs> turn 16. Uh, no, no, hey, look, he was a minute before I said that. He really was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, OK, fine. Somehow, that gap in first and second uh, overall has come down to two and a half seconds. It was, uh, it's, it's come down pretty... Well, I, I'd said it's fairly stable, but it hasn't been. It's come down a lot in the last few laps, particularly with that fastest lap of the race for K-Mag. Yeah, I'd, I'd said it was about 12 seconds, and then it went down under 11, and, and that was when we were talking about it not being too... Uh, not too much changing, and now it's down to a second and a half at the front of the field. One zero and zero one, a rather binary look to the top of the timing screen at the moment. Also, a good battle going on for the lead in GT Daytona, heading down towards turn 17. Oh, something's just come off one of the cars in front. It was the Lamborghini, the Grasso Lamborghini, I think. Or even the car that was ahead of that. That looked like a fairly substantial piece of bodywork that ended up in the grass. It might have been the prototype even in front of that, which is blue and red. I'll try and work that out as she, she gives us uh, a little more news about that special care, Kevin Magnussen. Well, I'm indebted to Ryan Smith, once again, the Corvette racing guru of uh, all things PR. He sent me a text and said, imagine that, a Magnuson going fast around Sebring. It's true, Kevin has it in his blood. Whether or not he's been here before, he just innately knows how to go well. Update from Sun Energy One as well, I can give you. And uh, thank you to the team for getting in touch. Uh, intermittent ABS and traction control on the AMG 
GT3. That is the number 75 Sun Energy One car. The Gradient team working on that, but intermittent is the horrible word there, Jeremy. And these GT3 cars are getting very, very complicated now. And even those ABS and TC systems are far more sophisticated than even three or four years ago. They are uh, really full race systems now uh, in these cars. And of course the drivers, the, the, the cars are built with those in mind and the drivers need them, those cars to, to keep turning consistent lap times. And it's all very well, you know, if it's there or if it's not, but if it's sometimes there and sometimes not, that's probably the worst of all situations. Yeah, really irritating. Uh, electrics, you know, the, the bane of everybody. We can't blame Lucas anymore either because <laughs> the, the systems are a lot more sophisticated now. But we've got a battle for the lead all of a sudden. A couple of laps to go, by the way, the last lap around. The lap, to, lap time for the leader was at 1.53.0. Uh, and a couple of laps before that, Magnuson turned at one forty six point two, so seven seconds difference. That explains why all of a sudden Kevin Magnuson is right on the tail of Billy Balbuca in that leading kind of a 10 for Conic and Minolta Acura team. Right up there now. Yeah, uh, yes, Jeremy. Uh, turn the gas up. Uh, we are starting to get a rolling boil here in culinary terms onto the back straight with uh, relatively little traffic ahead. The next car they will come across, uh, which they'll catch quite quickly, is Dan Goldberg in the Performance Technical Sport Leisure, number 38. That's an LMP3 car. It's the second place car in LMP3. Actually, that's just gone past uh, one of the GT cars. Didn't quite see which one that was. I think it was Lars Kern in the Faf Motorsport Porsche. Yes, it was. So that's the next car that they'll catch, which they are heading towards now. Uh, target acquired, I think, is what you would probably say for Kevin Magnussen and the Cadillac Chip Ganassi Racing Machine. As Simon Pagano is back in the pits in the number 48. And, and that, again, is early. That, again, is early. That's even earlier than the last time. They've got a fuel pickup problem or something like that, haven't they, Jeremy? It's getting worse. They were doing 20, 21, then 18. That, I think, is only 16 laps. Uh, maybe one glass in on 65. Yeah, 16 laps. So, yeah, that's uh, that's not a good sign for the number 48 team. Shea already on that. I can hear the wheels, the cogs turning. Battle for the lead in GT Daytona. Still Lexus versus right Porsche. They're coming down to turn 17 now. Battle for the overall lead. Goes past Lars Kern. They're into... Tower turn and ahead now that is the Dan Goldberg performance tech motor spot this year. Leader goes through, second place car can't get past the red, white, and black LMP3 car, so that's a little bit of a break for Philippe Albuquerque. This is all going to come to an end shortly, not because it's going to end in tears, but they've only got another couple of laps before they come into the pit lane. But what a stint this has been uh, from. Kevin Magnussen to close down the leader. There was one lap, Jeremy, lap number 79 for the leader, Philippe Albuquerque, which was uh, a 153. So that was the slow lap. So something happened on that lap. So it just took me a little longer than I thought to flick back and, uh, and find that. So that was where quite a lot of it went uh, he'd been pretty pretty solid up until that point uh, ran about the 49s 50s he did a 47 on lap 71 and a couple of uh, yeah. that's that's where most of the time when it went exactly a couple of laps so Magnus did it fantastically quick and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting to keep uh, an eye on that. The, the number 31 car, by the way, it, it's now three laps now because it, that would be uh, probably the next... Uh, he doesn't need a pit stop just yet, actually. I know. Uh, but uh, he's, uh, he's only three laps down at the moment and back up in... Oh, just, yeah, three laps down. He's back into up into 10th position overall in that number 31 car. 
but a good uh, good run by by those guys certainly to get themselves you know, a little bit closer to where they need to be they're still going to need some full course cautions they're not going to be able to make up three laps or four laps in total on uh, under green flag conditions not that fast but they are very quick yeah uh, and just for reference the leaders are on the back straight at the moment and the 31 car already heading down towards turn seven so out of big bend now uh, they were not so very long ago when they were both on the back straight together at that part of the lap. So 83 laps completed now by the leaders. Half a second. <laughs> Huge traffic jump ahead of Philippe Albuquerque. Past the Paul Miller racing Lamborghini, the number 25 BMW in there as well. And now going past a P2 and a P3 car, the two wins cars. Uh, livery cars together, one in P2, one in P3. So I think we had all classes in the race there. Coming out of turn one together, at least one example of each of the three class, uh, of each of the one, two, three, four, five classes in the race. And still Philippe Albuquerque holds on to his lead, in fact, extended it a little bit through that traffic phase as Kevin Magnussen is caught on the wrong side of one or two of those other category of machines that he was trying to drive around in the 01 Chip Ganassi Cadillac. But a bit, bit of room now before we catch up with the hard point portion number 88. After that, it's the leading Corvette and the leading GTLM car, the Corvette number three. That's the calibre of traffic that they're catching up with. Still no change in GT Daytona at the front of the field. And uh, one might think that uh, Pat Long in the right motorsports Porsche will know every detail of Kyle Kirkwood's Vassar Sullivan Lexus at the rear end, he's been staring at it for pretty much all of this stint, Jeremy. Well, look, he's closed up on it, in fact, uh, and he's, he's been with him now for a little while, uh, just inching closer and closer and closer to Carl Kirkwood. Uh, of course, having the number 16 car was kind of off kilter after its penalty at the start, uh, but we know how fast that car is, and, and uh, you know, he, he, number 16 car right now driven as you say, by Patrick Long, uh, and he's closing in. He's not going to do anything rash at this stage. He knows he's got a fast car, long, long way to go, but he has inched a little bit closer to Carl Kirkwood all the way through this stint. Uh, and third place now is uh, still Corey Lewis. He's fallen back uh, quite some way in the third position. Uh, about what, 15 laps ago, he was only five seconds behind uh, Patrick Long. Now, he's 20 seconds behind him. Now we've got another 10 laps of that battle before they need to pit, but the leading cars are into the pit lane. Shit, Adam. Hello, shit. Well, we... oh, sorry, we've, already had, we've already had one Pablo Montoya into the pit lane, or I uh, should say out of the pit lane, as he has installed himself aboard the pink Meyerson Racing Acura. Uh, the number 60 into the pits comes Philippe Albuquerque, and out of the pits goes Philippe Albuquerque aboard the number 10 Konica Minolta Acura. Uh, also into the pit lane, we are expecting any minute now, Special K to come back. It will be a driver change, so public service announcement for my mom, who is now in love with Scott Dixon. He's about to get aboard that 0-1 machine for his first stint of this race. Also into the pits of note in LMP2, Ryan Dial starting a triple stint aboard the number 18 era motorsports LMP2 machine. And hello, Guy Smith, you are no longer a rookie to WeatherTech competition, as he is now aboard the 22 for United Autosports for the first time. Uh, and that, I presume, was because uh, your mum, hello, Diane, uh, watched the Scott Dixon documentary recently, was it? Yeah, she might have watched that a couple nights ago and then called me and said, Scott Dixon is a really nice guy. And I said, yeah, Mom, I know I've been interviewing him for a long time. I, I still feel that way, too. She goes, no, but he's just a wonderful human being and his wife and his kids. Oh, my goodness. And I'm, I was, yeah. So, Scott, you've got a new fan, and, and Emma, for that matter, too. My mom is a fan of yours as well. And K-Mags is into the pit lane. Perfect timing. Scott Dixon doesn't want to hear us talking about him, so he gets behind the wheel of the Cadillac to go do what he does best, which is drive a race car. Um, interesting to note, Scott Dixon has never 
ever stood on the podium at the 12 Hours of Sebring. He's been fourth three times. So hopefully today that luck can turn around. Perfect execution by Chip Ganassi's boys and girls, just as you would expect. And a fun little note on this car, Dan Banks, who was longtime Corvette crew chief for the number three machine, his eldest son, Phil, is currently the crew chief oh, on wow. that 01 machine for Chip Ganassi. Both of them achieving their first times as crew chiefs at age 28. Happy belated birthday, Phil. Ah, great stuff. The big name continues in the Ames of Pit Lane. Very, very good news there. Second generation. Back into... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. No, no, yeah, the, the Mazda also into the pits on lap 85, so uh, 21 laps on that stint for uh, Jonathan Bomberito. The previous one was 22. The previous stint for uh, Oliver Jarvis also had been 22. So that's uh, the, the kind of the norm now. Occasionally, the Mazda can stretch it out to 22, but mostly it's 21 laps for a stint. That was the case for the uh, the uh, erstwhile leaders, number 10 and the number 01. Yeah, and that was a, a, a change then, um, was it, for the... Was that a change? It was a change from uh, Cameron de Montoya, which we did report, yes. and Jonathan Bomarito has changed to Harry Tickle. That's what I was yeah. trying to get to, but my adult brain wasn't allowing me. To. I knew what I wanted to say, it's just uh, the connections weren't quite getting made there. Uh, the zero one one car then back out into the traffic with Scott Dixon behind the wheel, as she told us. So we're starting to cycle through another set of pit stops. Be another 40 minutes before we see the leaders uh, back in. And, and, and she, we, we haven't got any problem for... 48 Cadillac, even though it's coming a couple of lots short. I'll ask you that again after we've had the GC <laughs> the month stops, because as soon as we start this, of course, everybody comes oh. at the same time. Here we go. And way to try and trick me, Philip Bang. He's got his helmet on, he jumps over the wall. Nope, he's just changing out the drinks bottle for Bruno Spangler. So it will be another stint for the Canadian DTM star behind the wheel of the red BMW. That one is the 25, for those of you keeping track at home. We did also just have a pit stop for the 24 BMW. That one is the black one. Augusto Farfus stayed aboard there. We are waiting for Jordan Taylor and Matthew Jaminet to come down the pit lane next. Uh, Jordan, let me check my notes. Uh, should be staying aboard because Antonio did a double and this is Jordan's first stint. Um, and also of note, a few minutes ago, we had a pit stop. Nick Tandy, three times a winner of the Sebring at 12 hour in the last three years, is now aboard the Corvette. So fans of his around the world can rejoice. So he's been out on track for almost half an hour now as uh, yeah, Jam Jam and uh, Taylor are the only two next ones to come back down the pit lane. But that was a perfect stop for BMW fuel tires. And yes, that tricky drinks bottle change by Philip Ang. Yeah, very good. Uh, one of a number of people who have tweeted at IMSA Radio, Gidazda, uh, Gidazda Posta, uh, asking what the story is on the 48. You have uh, been trying to speak to the team, Shea. What's the news? Yep. Um, they are not reporting that there is a fuel pickup issue of any kind. And actually, when they did do that pit stop, although it was a bit earlier than anticipated, they spent less time in the pit lane than normal. So perhaps they were just trying to top off. And, of course, the other thing that was pointed out to me, they are currently second, uh, well, excuse me, third in terms of the Michelin Endurance Cup. They are chasing down second, who are currently the... Um, well, battling pair second and first. The 10 leads the Michelin Endurance Cup with 18 points over at the 0-1 for Chip Ganassi Racing on 13. But that 48, right now they have one goal for this year. They're not doing a complete season. They want the Michelin Endurance Cup. So they have started to do the back timing to get their car into the pit lane so that it can be first on track when that eight hour mark elapses. Yeah, they are just doing the long races then. So Daytona here at Sebring, uh, Watkins then for the sale at six hours, and the uh, we'll talk to Taylor Mon. Steve, take off this one out. Uh, Watkins, Petit, Sebring, Daytona. Yeah, okay, four. Yes. So that is the Michelin Endurance Cup. First, of, first of the tranche of points being handed out to those 
in uh, about an hour's t- uh, an hour and a quarter's time. We're coming up to another clock hour, so I'll do a quick rundown uh, and uh, remind you uh, that you're listening to IMSA Radio with live coverage of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring presented by Advance Auto Parts. We're starting with. We'll start in GT Daytona, where the lead has just changed uh, as I was about to do the rundown. Right Motorsports and Pat Long uh, in a, uh, with an overtaking uh, manoeuvre in a place that I'm not sure I've seen that many, if any, overtakes completed before. Uh, that was Pat Long going up the inside at turn 16 of Carl Kirkwood. I'm not sure Carl was expecting that. So a new leader, Porsche leads in GT Daytona. It's Pat Long, Pat Long from uh, Carl Kirkwood, Wright Motorsports from Vassa Sullivan. Paul Miller racing in third, or about 20 seconds further back. Lars Kern with another Porsche. That's the FAF Motorsports Porsche number nine in fourth position. Is another 20 seconds further back. Uh, then it's the second of the Lexus, Vassa Sullivan, Heart of Racing, Aston Martin. They're having a decent battle, but they're another 20 seconds or so further back, and that's your top six. Uh, in GT Daytona, in, G- in LMP3, Dylan Murray leads for Riley Motorsports. He's got about half a minute on Dan Goldberg in the Performance Tech Leisure, the number 38 car there, and it's Austin McCusker in the 47 Motorsport Decay. That's the number seven car, another 20 seconds further back. In GT Le Mans, it's Corvette by 46 seconds from Machi Jaminet now in second position for WeatherTech Racing ahead of the two BMWs led by Spengler in the 25 and Farfus in the 24 in LMP2. Long, by the way, is rather making his escape. Carl Kirk would have to take off the lead in GT Le Mans. LMP2, it's win or the sport by uh, a minute and 13 seconds, but we're in pit stop cycle for those guys, but Ben Keating for Pio and Matheson Motorsport in second. That's the 52 win coloured car. Uh, and in third, it's Dwight Merriman for Era Motorsport in the number 18. Uh, that is your rundown as we've just got to past another hour. It's just after one o'clock at Sebring for the 69th annual Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. Uh, around the track on 99.1 WWOJ Sirius 216 XM 392 with flag to flag coverage there of the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring around the world on RS2. This is IMSA Radio, the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre at the moment, staffed by Jeremy Shaw and John Heindorf. And uh, Nick Damon, in a moment or two's time, will be taking over from uh, Shea Adam, who is going to go up and recharge her batteries. Jeremy, interesting hour that we've just seen there, not least that gap being closed down in the front of the field, and Scott Dixon is still only a second or so behind Philippe Albuquerque, so there's pace in that 0-1 car in this phase of the race. Yeah, after that round of pit stops, when the number 0-1 did change drivers and the number 10 did not, uh, on the first lap out, when they're back up to speed again, there was five seconds between them. But a couple of relatively slow laps there for Philip Albuquerque. He's just been super cautious, I think, through the traffic. Two laps in the 50s, and that has enabled uh, Scott Dixon to close to within a second and a half of the lead of the race. Uh, Simon Pagno, he's charging along and closing up on both of them in third position, uh, having... Uh, you know, he's... Not, he's, not, he's he, that car is fast, the one number 48 car. I had problems early on, but it's quick. And uh, it's on a slightly different strategy to everybody else. And we're going to have to wait and see whether they have a, whether we think they have a problem because they haven't done many laps in each of their last it's, And it's coming stints. back together because of that, Jeremy, isn't it? That yep. that, that strategy difference that they had uh, is, is not now uh, anywhere near as great. Uh, in fact, they've been out the longest now of the, the leading cars, other than really the Mustang... Watch, yeah. uh, uh, sampling car, which again is a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. So they're all sort of slightly different strategies there. But 49s again there for our race leader uh, 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 Albuquerque, but he's all of a sudden he's, that gap is down to nothing. Uh, on board him with number 79 car, by the way. That's the uh, Proton competition run WeatherTech uh, Porsche. has just made a pit stop out of second place of the class. Uh, that's 
just its third pit stop of the, of the day. And we're, what, nearly three hours into this race. The uh, leader remains at the free pit that we can get to stop it. The, the Porsche uh, having, uh, having, it was as much as, I think, nearly 90 seconds behind. It's now not far behind the, it's a lot closer than it was. It, I think it had overtaken or caught right up to the second of the BMWs. Uh, before in this latest lap, this latest pit stop, so that car is fast. Uh, the other note I wanted to point out was number 31 car, the Action Express wheel and engineering Cadillac that had the, the uh, incident early in the race at turn 17, had to come and make an uh, unscheduled stop. There's four laps off the pace. Uh, if they managed to gain one of those laps back on the race, and they did come into the pits again. Uh, last time around, uh, but it's now, so that'll drop it back to three laps behind, but it was four laps behind, so great stint there by Felipe Nasser. Not only got his lap back, but also turned 22 laps on that last stint in the number 31 car, so very much not out of it. With, you know, still nine hours remaining in this race. I don't know, I think they can make up for four laps uh, on the pace, Pure but pace. I don't know, maybe they can. Uh, Problem for Tristan Nunes while Jeremy was talking there. He's just out of the pits in the Win Autosport number 11. That's the leading LMP2 car. This was when it came into the pit lane. Uh, it's not going to be for very much longer because Ben Keating will be shooting by, even though he was back by about a minute and 20 seconds as the GT Le Mans pit stops start with the leader coming in to the pit lane, uh, and that is Jordan Taylor. Uh, he's done 28 laps on that stint, so again, not quite as well as they did uh, earlier on. I think Tristan's going to make that back into the pit lane. While he does that, let's welcome into the broadcast here on IMSA Radio, Nick Damon. Good afternoon to you, Nick. Uh, John, hello, Jeremy. Um, almost no shame, but she left. Uh, hello, everybody. Yes. She, well, she Lovely day to, it is in Sebring. Yeah, she, uh, she had to make way uh, for you. We'll get to Nick in a moment. He's keeping an eye on the pit and paddock report from VP Racing Fuel. And in comes the number 11 car of Tristan Nunes. And has dropped down to third position. Dwight Merriman and Ben Keating have both gone through uh, and taken away the lead. And that, as I say, was an outlap for Nunes. Now, has he not... Is it something as simple as not having his belts fastened? Because that was a very, very yeah. quick fist fix there, Jeremy. Uh, no, he's having trouble restart, uh, starting it. It was... Something down by his left hand side. I thought it was just a maybe a loose belt or something, but there's a shake of the head. There is a control panel down there as well. Ah, steering wheels come off now. So very complicated these cars nowadays, and so much going on that is controlled from the steering wheel. Get it. Looks like a fuse panel is being accessed by the mechanic through the left hand side door so another electrical issue jeremy not the first one we've seen here across the classes this week yeah it's popping no. fuses isn't it it's popping fuses that's what the problem is and yeah, there's a reset certainly... button there yeah he was uh, very slow uh, on the, on the racetrack and that's a uh, really bad news uh, for for that team they had a super run up until now uh, but uh, we'll try and find out exactly what that problem is. Uh, shake of the head uh, from yeah. Tristan there. That is very, very sad indeed. Nick, I know you've been keeping abreast of what's been uh, going on. Uh, not a bad, uh, not a bad first three hours. Yeah, action packed. Yeah, I mean, I, I did feel for uh, Pino De Rai when he got squeezed against the wall because that's um, that's happened to me virtually a couple of occasions. So uh, knowing it happens for real is obviously far more expensive and far more serious. Um, yeah, it looks like Nunes has got. I must. Admit, I saw him crawling around. I thought one of two things: it's either st it's either stuck in gear or they they filled it with air rather than fuel. But obviously they actually did manage to get the fuel and they did they did top it up for that it done. 
Mm. And it's got that you know, worst thing possible. It's got the electrical gremlin, you know. It's, uh, it, they, as you said, they're, they're pressing the, the reset boxes. They're trying to get the uh, control alt delete to work. But, you know, just waiting for it to fire up. And then I assume what happened was he, he wasn't getting geared, which is why he rolled down in probably the second oh, uh, round. Ah, the other thing it could be is that the um, that speed limiter wasn't coming off. Uh, yeah, that's another option. Yeah, I mean, same, similar sort of thing. You'd be running around at about 60 the miles an hour. TC, the plane with the TC, uh, uh, the traction control there, and that's another thing. If the traction control's gone into a limp mode or a default, of course, you won't get all the power from the engine. It effectively does a, a cylinder cut. The big yellow button on the far side is the system reset. Surprise, of course, getting electrical issues at Seabrook because the cars are shaking themselves apart on the bump. So if you've got um, a slightly dry joint somewhere in your sole thing or anything that's slightly loose, uh, this is the track where it's going to come away, isn't it? There speaks a man who builds uh, radio-controlled cars. The stat that we had earlier on from the Michelin engineers with it, if you added up all the suspension travel in one lap, um, it was 18 feet. Uh, Core Autosport have brought out the full course yellow. Uh, that is... Just after Big Bend, the number 54 CrowdStrike sponsored machine is moving again for Court Autosport in the. Oh, yeah, that's a reset. Heard the engine refire. So the yellow has come out with just over one minute to go before the nine hour mark. It's Jeremy Shaw and John Hindhoff with Nick Damon in this part of the race. But we are going to just, Jeremy, our second full course caution, yes? Yeah, indeed, and uh, it had been uh, 22 minutes, or so two and a half hours we've been uh, under green flag conditions there. And uh, as, as soon as the uh, yellow comes out, the number 54 car gets going again. Um, did, did you mention, yeah, the, the problem with that, that's pit lane speed limits are really unfortunate for that uh, number is, 11 Is car. that for sure? You've heard that from the yes. team? Right, yes, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, they're trying to cycle it, they change the steering wheel, still trying to figure out what that problem is. Uh, so yeah, that was... That going was, to watch for passing that information. That was, uh, that was one of the options there, with all the buttons that were being pressed to try and get the reset done. Uh, it looked as though the 54 car lost all power because the headlights went off, and I think that was dead stick as it coursed to a halt, but again, the old three-fingered salute of control of delete or whatever that is in that race car. Nine hours to go, 60 minutes before we hand out the first tranche of Michelin Endurance Cup points around the track on 99.1 WWOJ. Around the rest of North America on Sirius 217 XM392, and a particular hello to the safety crews. I know Mike's in Chiss. Chase two or chase three down turn five. Hello, Mike Phillips and the rest of the guys who are who always keep one ear on what's going on by uh, Sirius XM. It's a radio on RS2, and if you're in a territory that doesn't have a network TV deal, we've got pictures for you there as well. www.imsaradio.com. So the first uh, third. Check that quarter uh, of the race has been complete. This is how it stands. Eight tenths. Oh, well, let's forget the, the gaps, of course, because we're coming under full course caution. Philippe Albuquerque for Acura, then Scott Dixon for Cadillac, 10 and 0 1, then the 48 of Simon Pagino. Uh, this is uh, very interesting. Oh, Joao Barbosa has entered a closed pit. And let me see who else might have done that. So that's going to be, uh, I think that's the only car, the 33, Jeremy, uh, I reckon that. Sorry, Nick, without you. Yeah, no, I was just saying, it's probably, he, I saw him in, through the, uh, the shot we're getting at Tristan. I think he had emergency splash. He's, uh, he's allowed his, his one lap of fuel and come out behind him without emergency stop. Yes, uh, just emergency service. Yes, indeed. We just wait for the cars to pack up, so Bus Barbosa really tight on fuel, um, or did he have another issue in that uh, prototype for Sean Creech, yeah he'd done 30 laps, so he was due in, looks like the 
number 99 Porsche from EPM had to do the same thing so that was bad yeah he'd done 29 30 laps as well so very unlucky for those guys uh, emergency service I should explain that um, the pits are closed so it is an offence to come in and take service but of course it would be madness if you had a damaged car or were about to run out of fuel by driving around behind the safety car and therefore add to the issues on the racetrack and potentially stop the race from going back to green when it could do so in IMSA there is what's called an emergency service procedure You're allowed to come in and take five seconds of fuel or let's say you had a punctured tyre or a damaged rim or a bit of damaged bodywork you're allowed to attend to that and send the car back out again but you do have to come back in to the pit lane and uh, take full service again after the end of the safety car period so you still do I'm, I'm afraid get a little bit of a uh, a penalty for that but at least you don't get stranded out on the track. So now, who does this benefit? I don't think that's really... Do I'll tell you who it benefits. It's, it's the number 31 car. Oh, very much so, uh, yes. We, we are, we're about halfway through a stint here, so I would certainly expect the leaders to come on in right now. The number 31 car was in only, what was it, before five laps yeah, ago. Laps ago yeah, so yeah, that yeah. will get, that will now, I believe, be, uh, instead of three laps down be down it'll be uh, just uh, two laps off the ultimate pace um which is uh, extremely good news for the number 30, 31 car remember it was four laps down it gained one lap back during the last hour or so uh and uh, actually during, uh, because it's pace i don't think it actually passed the leader but it, was, it, but it kind of closed up enough and it was able to, to go through once the pit stops uh, took place but a uh, really good stint Brilliant stint from uh, Felipe Nasser. Uh, not only was he showing great pace, but also good fuel economy as well, doing a 22-lap stint in that number 31 car. So that's a big ben uh, benefactor here. Uh, who it doesn't really help is number five car. That's just gone back uh, down one lap because it was into the pit the lap before the caution came out. However, because of that, and in fact, I am expecting the other leaders uh, to come onto the pit lane, it should get that lap back again when the top five cars come onto the pit lane when the pits are opened. Yeah, if, uh, if you're struggling with the uh, IMSA.TV site for your pictures at the moment and you're somewhere where you can see them, i.e. not in the US, uh, try IMSAradio.com on the live uh, video feed there. Uh, I've just checked that, that's working fine. Uh, certainly here in the Hagley Global Broadcast Centre anyway but uh, worth giving it a go it is uh, showing work at the moment uh, at IMSA Radio by the way if you'd like to get in touch with us hashtag RSL Sebring benefit John is the number 79 Porsche because uh, it's just got the wave around. It had been lapped by the uh, leaders, but not by the class leader. So that is going to be back onto the lead lap in GTLM, as is the uh, number 24 car. Both those two cars getting a wave around during this uh, caution period. Uh, Nick Damon, list of cars that have taken emergency service in this VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reports. Yeah, I and mean, obviously it's never going to fall the right time for everybody, even though, of course, we saw the uh, most of the uh, DPIs had just come in for fuel. So the list of cars, it's the 33 we talked about with Halabos, the 99 with Earl Bamba on board, and unfortunately the 8 and That's the 23 have also come through. That's the so 8 that car, which is, which is Tower Motorsport, um, yeah. and the 23. Three cars just looking straight through the entrance, which is the heart of racing Aston Martin, which is going to upset at least one of our listeners. Yeah. So yeah, that was Sean Creech and EBM, uh, the the first two 33.99. Uh, so yeah, I think was Ross Gunn still at the uh, wheel of? Come back out again, yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Excellent. And Tim Beret in the eight, in the number eight. As I said, doesn't. Um, Uh, here come the leaders in the pit lane. Uh, Nick Damon, describe the action for us. Well, they're coming, obviously, 
this is a chance really for some swift pit lane uh, action to give you some track position as they come in as close as they can nose to tail half a second apart looking like full service certainly on the number one uh, Cadillac with Scott Dixon on board uh, full service on the uh, Sirius XM sponsored uh, Acura and that's also so they, they, I mentioned that they're all going for a full service but it's too too slow to play for it's even more than a 60 car actually with one, one on toys machines that's got the nose off and they're having a little bit of an adjustment on the suspension. So they're actually having a little bit of a, a wrench attack on the front right. That's not going to be, I would think, for a repair. They're doing it on both sides. They're actually making a setup change whilst they can during this, this stop. This means they'll drop back. Of course, they won't lose much track position because of course they get reshuffled into the order of, of, of DPI again. So they've obviously decided that losing track position of three or four peak, three or four cars is worth it for this change of the suspension setup. So must have got something slightly wrong. Perhaps it's bumpier than they thought, or perhaps they're taking the advantage to tune it more for the temperatures as they will first raise and then fall during the rest of this race, John. Nick Damon with that VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock report as the nose is still being held at the front of the MSR Acura. And unfortunately, exactly where we can't see what the work is that going on but there's quite a lot of wrench action in there uh, Nick yeah it's, it's it's unfortunately I don't I don't know having not been in the pit lane with those cars I don't quite know oh to shift the spanner it, it looks looks like steering arm they are doing well it could be the, yeah it could be they're just going to change the toe then they're going to be changing the um the attitude of the wheels normally um unlike road cars most race cars run with toe out to help the car tow in that means the the front wheels if you looked at them will actually have the front of the wheel is, is, is pointing away from the car and the rear of the tire is pointing towards the car it's called toe out uh, makes the car less stable in the straight line but these are racing drivers it does give them more bite on the turn it. now it could be they have too much bite not enough bite or it could be, of course, that they, uh, as they go over the bumps, it's changing too much. They may have neutralised it. Yeah, as we were saying, 18 feet per lap of suspension movement. If you add all the suspension... Um... 18 feet just dropped around Sunset Bend, to be honest. Well, <laughs> indeed, it is very, very bumpy. Very, very bumpy indeed. That uh, MSR Acura is back out of the pit lane. Thank you uh, for the moment, Nick. And... I'm trying to figure out why the number 48 car didn't come into the pits then um, with everybody else. It's been out 15 laps as well, 16 exactly. laps, yeah. yeah. Weird. Um, something uh, fishy down, because I don't think they were able to, I don't think, they, they, they could have been trying to get maximum, we've just gone past the three hour point in this race. Yeah, um, they, uh, yeah, they, they they're only doing the Endure, Michelin Endurance Cup, so they yeah, they will want only... to be leading at the top of the yeah. next hour. Ne exactly, that's what, that's my point. It's the next hour, not this hour. Yeah, correct. Uh, so I'm um, not quite sure why they would have stayed out there because they're going to need a, fairly, a stop fairly sooner. All I can think is that uh, some. It is four, eight, and twelve, isn't it? Four. I'm not getting that wrong. It's not. Uh, it's not three, six, nine, and twelve. Yeah, no, it's it's four, eight, and twelve. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, they'd been coming in a wee bit early, let's not forget. In fact, you know, last time on a full green flag run, they would have been in at the end of this lap. Um, that's what they did. They only did the what, 16, 17 lap run. Here come the GTs, Faf with the number nine Porsche. That's a driver change there, Nick Damon. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a very, very busy pit lane. The entirety of the GT field rolls in. I anyone's actually not got it. Look, 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 that's the LMP3 drive. Yeah, we haven't yet seen a couple of the, the back of the GTD field. Just wondering whether they haven't actually got round the corner yet to uh, to enter uh, the pit lane yet. But currently, yeah, that's at the uh, Allegra Motorsport 28, the Magnus uh, 9, Andy Lally, the Team Harmore EBM 88, and some of the G75 have all decided not to come into the pits. Uh, at the moment, they are running, and the rest of the cars at the front end have come in. And um, you can probably change them. The, uh, no, more people taking, yes, that's a, that's a rotor change by the looks of it on that uh, very attractive and vibrant Lexus car from. Uh, I think it was just pads, wasn't it, Nick? They weren't rotors as well. Well, yeah, but don't forget... I, I oh, don't no, no, you're right. I take that back. You're not, you're not allowed to have... Am I right that you're not allowed to have dry brakes on GTV? You can't have a dry brake system. I think that's what, I think that's difference on... I, uh, this is information I think I'm half remembering from Daytona, to be honest, about some of the distances in, in uh, IMSA, whether you can have a dry brake system, which is where you can take off the caliper without having to worry uh, as one unit, without having to worry about 
getting brake pressure the uh, the fluid back up again, but they are doing a, a rotor change. So they must have decided that the car can't do the 12 hours um, without some form of, uh, of, of change, but it can do eight. So they've probably got a set of brakes at like nine and a half hours. So they thought the first chance to get the first what looks like a decent yellow flag after T minus you know, nine hours, maybe, maybe, we will change our brakes and get them going. So. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot more action happening in the pit lane than you normally expect for a simple yellow flag. You've got people making, making suspension adjustments. You've now got people doing early brake changes. Run to the flag. People are, are already, as you say, pack timing to uh, ten past ten uh, Florida time this evening. Yeah, uh, just a very interesting. Uh, they are going for it. Uh, it's the old-fashioned way of having the the uh, brake caliper spreaders there, the pad spreaders with the big long handles and you look over the top to your mate on the other side one two three do it now because what you don't want to do is uh do one side and not the other then you've got to try and get the pistons back and bleed the brakes uh, meantime more corvette issues as well nick damon this is the car that had the problems earlier on had issues. It's needed control alt delete with Tommy Milner, and they've been still running a bit, a bit low on power. The car's got nicked handy. Now they are now uh, having a go at getting the airbox off, which will expose the top of the engine. Now that might give them access to the coil pack. So it could be they've got a Correct. misfire, which needs uh, you know a replacement of the coil pack. And of course, this just takes too long under the green flag. We've got a, a lap time of. Uh, you know, five or six minutes you do with a with behind the safety car. You can get in, get out with a good team uh, and get a core pack change. They know number seven is not working properly. That's the one they can do, just arrow arrow sharp onto what it is. My, my guess is what they've done is that they, said, is they are chasing this misfire, which is the worst thing of all, super intermittent. It's Nick Dearman as that work goes on. Uh, another car, Jeremy, that has benefited here was the delayed Sun energy one number 75 amg they pitted just i was just looking to see who pitted they pitted not long before that yellow came out kenny and bull in the car so double bonus for them uh, eating into kenny's drive time no disrespect to, uh, to kenny but he's not losing any pace to any of the drivers around him he's not gaining anything either to those he is quicker than but also he is uh, he's got one of his laps back so that's uh, I think now they're only two laps back now Kenny obviously is going to have to steer ahead of them United Autosports came in Nick and has not gone out yet Guy Smith brought the number 22 in uh, and by the way Nick Tandy sent out in the Corvette just before the safety car came through so they were clearly watching that as well at Corvette Racing go Nick yeah Nick of course still though is, is two and a half uh, is, yeah, two, is a lap still when it comes around. He's currently scored two laps down because he actually did come out just in front of the uh, safety car go back to one lap down on the leaders in GTLM, which is currently Bruno Spengler in the M8 GTE. Yeah, we still got Guy Smith in the pits uh, in the P2 Orica for United, and he is... Uh, only joined by Tristan Nunes in the other LMP2 car. This is the car which didn't, which, which whilst was in pits, didn't, didn't actually cause this yellow flag, but was already struggling with some form of uh, gearbox electrical issue. And also in the pits again now, it is Earl Bamber with the team Harport, EBM, uh, Porsche, and also his command Lally. So actually, Andy Lally didn't come in the previous lap. So uh, some of the GTD cars have, have come in a lap later. Uh, some are still staying in. Earl Bam, who of course did have to be the emergency stop, has come back in again. I think this now be for the real stop. So the emergency stoppers are also coming in now. So at the end of this uh, this period, absolutely everybody has been fit. Hopefully, they've left it. But uh, Tristan Nunes is the big question. Jeremy, just digesting this uh, at the moment. Uh, what strikes you? It's not, obviously not the uh, Corvette number fours, dear. We uh, know that for sure, but a chance for them at least to get a look at that, and that might bring it. But they were a good couple of seconds off the pace there in the, in the early part of the race. Yeah, they were certainly struggling uh, early on, and yeah, the, their best lap is, is a second away from the other contenders in GTLM. So at least now they can have a good good look through it and see whether they can get back into contention. I think that car's now going to be with that pit stop. It's going to be, I think it's still just, just one lap down to the leaders in GTLM, so you know all is not lost yet, that's for sure. Um, but uh, this is this should certainly benefit uh, a couple of the prototype cars. The, it's the wave around ha happening now, where uh, for those of you familiar at the racetrack, not familiar with the uh, systems here in IMSA, any cars that are trapped in between the safety car and the class 
and its own and its class leader uh, can go past the safety car, run around to the back of the pack, and take up position at the tail end of the field. Uh, and that uh, should benefit the, the number five car, which is now just uh, one lap, which is now, I think, should be back on the lead lap again. Uh, and the uh, number 31 car, which should now, I think, be uh, just uh, two laps back. And where is it? Going back to green now. Did that not take place? Uh, I've got so much on the uh, race control channel that I can't scroll back to that now. Uh, we are going back to green and the Cadillac DPI of Simon Pagino then led them across the line with a handy 1.5 second lead. And looking at a little bit further back down the roads, Tristan Vautier who is a lap off the lead, is now second in the line and has only one car to pass before he gets back to the front of the, the field. He's been followed along by Felipe Nasser, who, of course, is three laps uh, off the lead. All a little bit of a lot of going into the hairpin by the Mustang sampling Cadillac. It stays ahead. So the dark grey with... Uh, gold striping on it, desperately trying to get somewhere near Pagino. So what happened there is the, the number 31 car wasn't able to get... Oh, because the number 48 car stayed out. Okay, Correct. That's, that explains Correct. it. That is why uh, the, the number 31 car didn't get to back on the lead lap. Yes, that, OK, fine, that explains it. Uh, that it also... Uh, well, that's curious because uh, they're both actually express run cars. And by staying out on the race track, number 48 car denied the 31 car an opportunity to get to get one lap back. That's kind of curious teamwork. Well, and Pagino's due in in a lap or two, so very interesting. Nick Damon, uh, the fix that we had been hoping for for Nick Tandy uh, might not have been completed, but they did actually send him out. I wonder if they didn't put the airbox back on properly just to get him out ahead of the safety car. Yeah, because they sent him out at the safety car again, and then he, he sprinted round whilst the rest of the field followed the safety car, and he went back in the pits again, and then they threw him out just slightly again uh, in front of the field. At that point, the field was at full speed, so he'll be uh, swallowed up by the DPIs, but I think he's already been swallowed up by the DPIs uh, already, because he got out a few seconds before them, but they obviously didn't say, John, they, they thought they could get an extra lap. They probably wanted an extra lap of, uh, of yellow to get him back on the field, but of course, if we get rolling again, we won't know whether this can actually fix the car as far as the performance is concerned. Uh, and also a problem for Sean Creech, the 33. So Sean Creech Motorsport, the uh, 33 prototype, getting a penalty nick. Yeah, not not for the major service requirements. So because they can now stop and have a 10 second stop and go. So uh, the question would be what he did wrong. My guess is he probably uh, either uh, overfilled. We come in at the first available opportunity to do this. Oh, and a big oh. One, John. Yeah, that is the Grasser Lamborghini and. Is there just one car or two cars in there? I think there's two. Uh, there's uh, another, there's uh, one of the, the green AMG. That is the Sun Energy car, I think, that's in there with Kenny a bull at the wheel. So this is showing as a short yellow, but it is a yellow. And they're facing the wrong direction. They've moved the wall. That is a serious impact from both of those cars. Uh, on the far side of the circuit. 75 was being driven by Kenny Abul and the GRT had Frank Pereira at the wheel, the Lamborghini. So two cars with green colour schemes in the wall at turn three, I think that is. The, once again, the tyres have done a great job. That is super quick going into there through turn one, no lift through turn two, and then trying to get the car slowed down. Yeah, that is turn three. The Lamborghini was in fifth position in the class, and of course the 75 was uh, a couple of laps down. So uh, that is uh, unfortunate. Yeah. Very quick on the yellow. And we've got the AMR Porsche Cayenne intervention vehicle already there. Uh, whilst we wait for news uh, of the situation with the Corvette C 
eight are back out on the oh, see eight back out on the circuit to lead the field around nick Tierman, the msr number 60 with the adjustable spanner we've had some news from dan layton about that yeah they were actually they weren't they weren't working on the uh tow links they're working on the push rod so they've, they've either lengthened or shortened the push rod to increase or decrease the rod oh. height my particular guess is they've increased it um, because they've probably found that the bus is a little bit more um, uh, active when they get into traffic um, and, they, and they lose a bit of the, of, the, of, the, of the nose wind. So what they're trying to do is just get the car to ride the bumps a bit better. It's unlikely to be upset the car was, was riding the wind too well. So um, I guess they just add a little bit of ride height just to make it easier to handle the very difficult situation is the Sebring surface. Uh, the EMG in there, by the way, it isn't the green of the 75 it is the green header reels that i could see uh, and that was the only bits i could see from allegra uh, for the 28 and so that was the car that went in that was billy johnson who was behind the wheel there uh, it was so buried in the tires i could only see the green around the top of the car so my apologies for the misidentification and uh, worrying people down at Sun Energy. Definitely the GRT Grasa Lamborghini, but it's the 28 Allegra car in there. And already we've got the flatbeds in there. Ready to take those cars away. They've got in side by side. It's clearly half or three quarters spun. It, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, so I just said yeah, uh, and, and they were they were running quite high up, Jeremy. I think they were in in the top four or five, weren't they, um, at the the restart? Yeah, yeah. No, the, the 28 and the 19 were battling for position. Sorry, I thought we I thought we no, I, I, I mis I misidentified I, I misidentified it yeah, no, first up, no, and no, then no, it, they, they, when they I were... saw it from the other side, because the the first view that we saw was from behind the fence, and I could only see the green part of the uh, the roof and the orange, and I thought it was the uh, the Sun Energy car, and once I we saw it from behind, I realised it was the Allegra car. Yeah, so no, that they were battling for fourth and fifth positions, uh, those two. Uh, so they're going to uh, exit the uh, the stage, which is uh, un unfortunate. So two of the, the uh, contending cars are now out of uh, out of out of the uh, out of contention. Frank Pereira is out of the car. You might have heard the cheers from the crowd, just uh, letting them know that uh, they are pleased to see him all right. He looks a little bit shaken, but he's walking uh, pretty much unaided. Billy Johnson uh, is... Uh, his driver's door is stuck up against the wall. It was at turn two, uh, actually, uh, through into three. They were battling for position. Oh, Pereira lost it early, and Billy Johnson uh, was... Uh, absolutely nothing to do with him. Frank Pereira losing it under the brakes, tried to go to the inside and avoid the EMG, but was uh, heading to the scene of the accident very quickly, and all he uh, did was take Billy Johnson with him, I'm afraid. Uh, Billy Johnson out of the car and has been speaking to his team before he got out of the car. The reason it took so long for Billy to get out was because his driver's door was wedged up against the right up against the driver barrier his helmet is off he's talking to the safety crew so again a confirmation of the two cars the allegra motorsport mg and the frank pereira that was billy johnson the frank pereira driven grt grassa lamborghini expect, uh, mistake you would make expect to frank pereira to make a hugely experienced of course, is uh, is Frank the Frenchman, and uh, yeah, that's uh, wow. He just he just lost it, didn't he, on the, on, on the brakes? Weird with with ABS on these cars. Well, strange. one or two people who he, have been reporting ABS problems, of course, uh, on yeah. although that was on an, a, um, an AMG, of course. Sorry, Nick Damon. Uh, news yeah. news from you was the I, scores on. No, I, I, I just sorry, I was just echoing. A similar thought to to Germany. Realistically, you know, on a GTE car, if that car had done that, you'd say, right, he's got his brake bars too far to the rear. He's locked the rears and, and, and under heavy braking and cold tyres. 
on the the restart but with abs you wouldn't think that would happen so it's a or it's very much less likely to happen so it's, it seems again like a like a failure which is or, or a or a confusion and you looked at the speed in which Pereira actually actually hit the other car that was also interesting. there wasn't that much retardation going on either even after he'd thrown it across the curb yeah true enough and moved the concrete barriers back a, a decent uh, run as well. Uh, no better news, I'm afraid, after the uh, long look at the top of the engine behind Nick Tandy from the number four Corvette, Nick. Yeah, it's done the thing which uh, means bad news in American motor racing, that it's gone behind the wall. They couldn't work on it on. They tried the best they could with a bit of time on the pit lane, and it's not going to be a, a fourth consecutive win, I'm afraid, for Nick, unless there's some, some ridiculous selection of circumstances. Back behind the wall, they'll have a chance to get the airbox off, have a look at all the uh, um, the, the injectors and the uh, sparks and see exactly why this thing's not running properly. Um, but they're going to have to... This could be quite a long yellow because I would say, if they, if, depending on what the rules are and how fixed it needs to be, that's quite a long, a long repair unless they get something very, very big and very, very heavy to push that concrete back straight again. On on the back side of it as well, on the, the outside of the track actually is where they need the the forklift or the uh, front loader. And Grasa Lamborghini looking particularly second hand on the right front, but both of those cars taking a pretty big impact. And proof, if proof were needed, that whilst to GT3 might be uh, one of the uh, entry classes to GT uh, racing. Those cars are beat to very high safety standards. There was literally no retardation at all from Pereira. Got onto the kerb at turn three and tried his best not to hit the back uh, or the side of the Billy Johnson AMG, the Allegra car. But uh, it was sort of airborne as well when the first impact happened and then there was a second impact as well Billy Johnson's car actually spun further round uh, clockwise so most of the damage is to the left front there whereas the GRT Grasa Lamborghini uh, hadn't got quite as far round or at least was straightening it, straightening it up at that point and therefore it's the right front of that car that came into the heavy contact. Well, they have managed to get not one, but two large uh, front loader forklifts, one either side. The problem, the problem, the one that is on the outside of the circuit has got is it's uh, gonna be difficult to get access because we've got one of our camera towers right, be right behind it. But this, as Jeremy, this, as uh, Nick said, is not going to be a, a quick fix here. Uh, and sort of reasonable for Simon Paginot. He's staying out in the lead, but surely that's got to come in shortly. Nick Damon, he's been out, uh, this is 23rd lap out now, and it's also going to completely ruin their tactics for the... Uh, the four-hour mark, if uh, this goes on for very much longer. Well, it's 23 laps. But we've had what six of those or seven of those under caution, um, which is you know nine, at, no. most, at most at most half fuel. Nine of those. So it's at most half fuel. You know, you you can tickle those things along on virtually nothing on uh, on on, on non-race. So he's, I mean, he's, he's not happy because it's, this is not going to be a short stop. But, you know, you, you kind of think there's going to be at least another 10 minutes sorting this out, which is another what uh three laps at this speed so it's going to be very very touch and go he will take it to the fumes um and uh, and hope to have something work for him but uh yeah a big risk and of course if they do go in as you say there's two there's two elements it's going to absolutely louse their um their strategy up because they have to do a emergency stop first and then a second stop uh which will stop them but both ruin their trap position and their attempt to uh for the endurance cup um that's about that's half, our mark. Ha half an hour away so they've mm. still got half a chance of that, um, I suppose. Uh, see, I, I see that's, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because this is, this has meant that the other cars aren't going to have to stop again. Mm. They were, they would have run over their 40-minute 
soon, wouldn't they? But now they won't because they've, they've only ran one lap of green and now they're going to have 20 minutes of, of yellow. So they'll easily be able to run on the fuel they've got past four hours, which they wouldn't have done. Whereas the Ally, the Ally Cadillac is going to have to uh, come in and stop and, go, and drop to the back of the queue. So they're going to have a best, a best case scenario of um, fifth, aren't they? Because there's two cars which are laps down. So that's really not worked in their favour at all. And as an aside, Nick Tandy's back out again, John. Ah, so he's come out from uh, uh, in the paddock area. Thank you. Uh, into the pit lane that time around was the GTD second place car. And Jack Hawksworth is aboard that now. Jeremy, that is the number 14 Lexus. Uh, yes. Sorry, what was that, John? I uh, missed ja that one. Jack Hawksworth uh, in and out for emergency service in the number 14 Lexus. Oh, oh OK. That's curious, because he was in... He was in with everybody else, I think, during, during the, uh, at the beginning of this... Yeah, during the previous caution period, so that's curious that he should have to come in again to check that one out. Uh, what that last caution period did do, though, was get uh, the Magnus Racing Acura of Andy Lally back on the lead lap in GTD. So, unfortunately, we lost two of the lead lap cars, number 28 and the number 19, through that incident. But number 44 car is on the lead lap uh, with everybody else in, uh, in GTD. Yeah, and anybody who has in any of the classes where you've got to get time in for a bronze driver anybody who has their driver in at the moment um, you can't plan for these things and but it sometimes just falls that way track services and the safety team working really hard to tidy things up and what they're going to have to do is unfasten the steel hoses the steel cables on the catch fencing and take some of the tension off before they start moving the concrete blocks that have the catch fencing poles uh, into the holes in the top of them. As otherwise, all you're going to do is, uh, is snap the steel cables that tension the catch fencing. And uh, that is not at all, of course, what it's going to be. So this is a complicated and delicate task that has been done here. It's not just a question of brute force and pushing those concrete blocks back it's going to be done in a safe way so that if that ha accident happens again and we have another two cars in there that it does exactly the same job as it did the first time around yeah i mean that's going to be difficult because those actual blocks are still cabled together aren't they um they're not sitting individually i think some of those steel cables um, there tends to be a one, stick one. in the ground every, right. uh, uh, yeah. uh, at least every uh, block, uh, at every block, the, should I say. Yeah, the one, the one, one um, a little bit towards the right-hand side, as, as the, the, if you're lucky enough to the pictures, it's it's very bad. To the right-hand side, so actually left-hand, as the cars go past, that that's, has ne is no longer attached to its, its stake either. Um, they are they're, they're, you know, getting, getting a very good speed on now as they, they, they push the, the, the presenting blocks and they're also now trying to rearrange the tyres as well. They're going to bring in some new tyre bundles because a couple have been uh, US'd by the uh, impact of a Lamborghini and a Mercedes. But um, yeah, still a few minutes to go. But it's a, it's a very, very efficient operation, isn't it? They really are putting out all the stops. And they have absolutely, they knew exactly how to get this sorted out instantaneously. Yeah. Just a bit of information from uh, Ryan at Corvette. It was a coil problem when the coil packs had come loose. So when they, once they got the engine cover off, they could see what had happened. Slapped it very hard and thought, oh, no, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a $10 piece that's going to cost us a really good chance of victory. Yeah. Hello to Alex Brundle. I know that you're watching and uh, listening. Thank you for uh, your inputs and uh, lovely to see that you are gainfully employed again in your day job behind the wheel for 2021. And uh, try and get back in the commentary booth as well at some stage over the season when his busy racing schedule allows and hello Alan McNish 
as well, who is uh, listening desperately uh, waiting to uh, get his new job away from Formula E and in the uh, Paris-Dakar on the Audi programme as well, I'm sure. <laughs> That's that's the that, that's the new program they'll put him on the Parry Dakar one. Mm. <laughs> Somehow doubt that. <laughs> the choice, the two programs they have. We'll see. <laughs> Depends how good he's been. Has he been naughty or nice this year? That's oh, the question. Oh yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point, John. Yeah, because it's yeah. You know, well, Alan. Yeah, really sorry about this, but it's Dakar for you. This is not too far away from being finished, actually. This has been a cracking job by the track services team. And you have to be prepared for, for absolutely everything. We've been a little over 17 minutes behind the safety car. Uh, we were 19 minutes before that. And then we basically had a lap of green. And before that, just over two hours and 35 minutes. Uh, Good to see Jeremy. A bit of uh, a bit of improvisation going on here with the uh, the way that the the blocks are being moved to make sure that things are safe on that very high speed entry to turn three, of course, and that's why they're taking taking that time and trying to get it right. Well, that's right. With that t the the, uh, the camera tower there, the, uh, the there isn't room for the front loader to to go perpendicular to that block so they're having to just sort of nudge it um, which is uh, takes a bit of skill I would I would imagine um, but uh, that's what they're doing uh, because you know the, 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 the safety is of course paramount and even though there's a, a pretty healthy tire barrier in front of those uh, concrete blocks they still need to be properly aligned before we can get back to racing Frank Pereira back with his team released yeah. Uh, from the infield care centre after the standard check-up. Yeah. Uh, don't read anything into that. That was a big incident. The guys don't have any option. They're taken back there. We'll wait to give you some news as well about Billy Johnson, who was the other car there. Hawks within and out again. But he is the last of the running GT Daytonas. So that may be an ongoing issue there for that number 14 Lexus. Do our next uh, Mazda in-race update in about 10 minutes time, but I'm going to do it a little bit early actually, because I think we might be back racing by then. And I don't want to uh, interrupt if we have just gone back to green. So with eight hours and 20 minutes remaining behind the third safety car, of the 2021 Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring presented by Advance Auto Parts. It is Simon Pagino for Ally Cadillac, the number 48 that leads from Harry Tinknell and Mazda in second in the 55. Philippe Albuquerque behind the wheel of the Acura number 10. Three different DPIs in the top three positions. Then it's the second of the Acuras, Juan Montoya in the number 60 MSR car. It's the purple machine. The 01 of Scott Dixon in what I was describing as the putty coloured car earlier on. That's Cadillac Jeep Ganassi Racing in fifth position. Those top five are on the lead lap. Not able to get back on the lead lap on that restart. Tristan Fortier in the number five Mustang sampling. JDC Miller, that's the black or dark grey and gold car. And still three laps off the lead after clipping the wall in turn 17 earlier on when people Durrani was at the wheel it's the wheel and engineering car like the red and white car in seventh position that's the seven dpis in lmp2 dwight merriman is behind the wheel of the leading origa it's the 18 from era motorsports pr1 matheson in second and that is Ben Keating in the wins car, the 52 Origa, and third John Ferrano for Tower Motorsport uh, in the Origa number eight. And they are all on the lead lap. Guy Smith for United Autosports has now dropped uh, three laps after that long stop for the number 22. 
element he shall be delighted with Harry Tinknell uh, somebody that he looks after in second position uh, as well which realised why Alan is tuned in um, GT Le Mans Bruno Spengler for BMW Team RLL leads there from Jordan Taylor and Corvette Racing that's 25 from 3 from 24 the second of the Rahal Letterman Lanigan BMWs has Augusto Farfus behind the wheel and the fourth of the cars that are on the lead lap is the WeatherTech Porsche, the 79 car. And uh, Matt, as I say, in fourth position. LMP3, Dan Goldberg for Performance Tech leads in the 38 Leisure from Austin McCusker in the number seven of 47 Motorsports. That's the Duquesne in second place in P3. And Schwab Barbosa for Sean Creech Motorsport. I think has fallen off the lead lap in... No, he hasn't. He's just gone across the line now. Yes, he has. He's fallen off the lead lap in, in LMP3. Just had to wait for the safety car line to go through there and check that up. In GT Daytona, it's Paul Miller Racing's Lamborghini. Corey Lewis uh, leads in the number one from Lawrence Vanter for Faf Porsche. That's the plaid coloured car for number nine in second. And right motorsports, Jan Halen in the blue, number 16. That was the pole sitting car. Third place, Roman De Angelis. Roman De Angelis in the heart of racing. Aston Martin, the number 23. Fifth, Bea Figueredo for Team Hardpoint ABM in there. Porsche. It's the 88 car. Zach Veach makes up the top six for Vassa Sullivan. The other Vassa Sullivan, Lexus, uh, Nick Damon. Uh, had some brake issues. Well, we saw them come in during the, uh, the the first of these two stops, very close to the two yellow flags, and, they, and him and his teammate both uh, had a complete um, pad change at the front, or brake, brake rotor and pad change at the front. Um, then they found out that they had to replace a brake hose. Sometimes you knock something and they've lost um, uh, a bit of pressure and, and, and they've had to bleed it as well. That takes some time. And then apparently he had to come back in again because they hadn't actually touched the hood properly. So um, it sounds like someone's going to get a severe talking to about uh, about not breaking things whilst you're trying to mend them. Uh, but uh, he's back out again. Uh, but uh, I think he's... Do you manage from running... Could you stay on the same lap? Or I think he's lost. He's lost track position. See where, where, where it unwinds, whether he's actually lost the lap or not. Um, also, unfortunately, uh, despite running a single lap to see if things were fixed, Tristan Nunes in the win Autosport Orica, he's come back in the pits again. So obviously they, they, they tried all the control all deletes they could, John, but the electrics still aren't um, behaving themselves and they are the, in the pits. In fact, I believe they are the only car in the pits now, uh, despite the fact that the 33 car, who you mentioned earlier, whether they're on the right lap or the wrong lap, which of course is the Sean Creech Motorsport car with Howard Versa, has once again not managed to do its emergency pit stop properly uh, and hasn't uh, fulfilled its emergency requirements. So it's got its second stop and go of 10 seconds. OK. Uh, so, reminder then, after that Master In Race update, whilst the work continues, you're listening to IMSA Radio live coverage from Sebring for the Mobile One 12 hours. Around the track, you can listen on FM 99.1 WWOJ, Sirius 216 XM 392, and around the world on RS2, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Uh, that's how it stands then. With the safety car still out, uh, we will move into another clock hour in a couple of moments' time here on RS2. So, still a bit of tightening to do of those cables. And once that has been uh, completed, then I think we shouldn't be too far away from uh, getting back to green flag racing. The cars were... Uh, the cars were cleaned up quite some time ago and both of the drivers, I believe, have exited the pit lane uh, or the infield care centre, I should say. And I'm 
sure that uh, there'll, there'll be a little word being hard just to find out the circumstances of that to find out whether it was a big issue or a small issue or just a mistake by Frank. Not saying there was anything at all malicious there, but uh, I'm sure race control will want to know. Shea Adam is rejoining us. Hello. Potentially a nasty incident there, Shea, but good news is it looks like whilst the cars will need fixing, uh, it's only carbon and metal, and the important thing is that the two drivers uh, seem to be fine.